All right, uh, we are now currently live. We should be good to go. Let me just slightly move the webcam a little bit. Hopefully that's not in the way for people that are watching on mobile. Okay, um, real quickly, we're just back on live again. Uh, we were on earlier today. Uh, just to kind of share some of the things that were going on currently for um, the registration tonight for classes, but also just to kind of work on things. I'm currently working on a solo show coming up uh, at the midpoint end of this of November. So I have to get a collection of work together. So um, that's what we're kind of getting into right now is that I was developing some of the pieces. This is from the piece of earlier today. Uh, we had done the pen sketch for this one. I just did the watercolor uh, after I finished up, you know, had a bit of food, rested a little bit, and I came back in. And I finished up on the watercolor piece here. So once that was done, um, wrapped it up. So it turned out okay. You know, it was more of just a quick wash of anything else. Uh, we're going to do another piece here um, using the same kind of paper. I'm going to use a, a slightly different pen. Uh, I'm not going to be applying watercolor to this one. It'll be just mainly black and white. Um, so I definitely will plan to uh, expand on our live streams for today. <clears throat> Next time I'll be on, most likely will be for this coming week. Uh, tonight is registration for classes. It'll probably continue through the week as well, too, as people are kind of, you know, aware of what's going on. Weekends gets a little bit slow on social media because people are resting and not really, you know, kind of jumping on a lot of stuff. Um, so I'll continue to really kind of announce and share what's going on as we go through the rest of the weeks. But as I do so, I'll be jumping on doing these live streams again, like I said, probably like every other day, potentially. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'll be, I'm planning to actually create a lot of these pieces, so I have to keep doing the collection of work here. So... I might as well jump online and do that. Anyways, so what I plan to do, I actually have another piece in mind as to what I'm going to draw here. Uh, what I plan to go for is, is another scene, not with the, the character of the blacksmith. This would be some type of like um, like a demon Oni kind of character, more humanoid of anything else, nothing like grotesque or anything like that. But I had this imagined scene of like him uh, eating, like having a setup where it's got like a big pot of stew and you know all these assortment of things even animals that he like chopped up and kind of put into this big uh, uh feast for himself i don't know why i thought of that it was just one of those things in mind of, a, of an image where i really like not necessarily mundane scenes i like really more of um personable scenes uh, and i find them to be very kind of enjoyable as a, as a aspect of drawing but also just in terms of like storytelling aspect of it I just find them to be fascinating. You know, like even the idea and concepts of like, I did a series of images one time. It was sketches of drawings of heroes that were like sleeping, you know, because everybody's asleep at some point, right? Uh, especially if you're human. Uh, and I always imagine like these, you know, powerful soldiers and Vikings and all that kind of stuff. But imagine them at their most vulnerable moments, which would be sleeping, <laughs> you know? So I, I drew a, a series of sketches of those years ago. But I always love those kind of moments. And when I draw people, I like drawing people not necessarily like model setup because they're like going to be posing and all dynamic action, which are great in itself. But I've always imagined like when people or I, I like observing people when they're kind of in the more natural state, you know, they're on their phones or talking to each other, the hand gestures, emotions, how gravity kind of like pulls them down a little bit. They're kind of slouching. I don't know. I found those poses to be a lot more interesting to draw because they were more human. Um, anyways. Here or there, that's what this scene is going to be about. Uh, we have we do have a, like an Oni character. It's going to be a back shot though, so you're not going to see his face. It's going to be the back of him over here. Head's going to be probably about up there. I want the image to be covering this amount. Um, if anything else, what I'll probably do real quickly, I'm going to take my pencil, not to draw with, but just to mark a general frame, because I want this to be in a frame, an actual glass frame. So I want to give myself a bit of a border. I don't want to draw past these marks right now. Um, in the other piece here because you know I kind of gave it a little bit of a white border it should be okay it should be more than enough uh, to have it within a mat so this one too I'm going to preemptively do that one here so within this space head will probably be about there body will come down down angle view uh, pot and all the ingredients of stuff just all around it so I want this to be a very densely packed image uh, so I'm going to try to start and establish a scale first over here and I usually kind of talk about how I set things up because I could just start drawing right away and you can kind of see the reveal happening, but I think if people know what's going to come up and I explain about the mental process of what I'm trying to do here, I think it gives you guys a little bit more insight as to like how some of the planning for someone like me, you know, does something like this, um, where not everything is just like a direct image in my head. I have an idea in mind. And from there, I just have to adapt and try to problem solve it as I go over here. Um, couple of questions on, on Twitch. Uh, do I use watercolor sometimes? So all the, the stuff over here on this side was all watercolor. 
The watercolor I've been using was this brand right here. This is the Schmink watercolor brand. Uh, it's a whole palette setup that I customized myself. I bought the tin empty and I then hand selected all my colors for this one and I uh, put it together. So uh, this one I put together when I was in Austria. I went to an art store out there who has a really great selection of watercolors uh, from this particular brand. So um, I bought a bunch of these cubes and I bought a, bun I bought a bunch of um, tubes as well for refill. So this is like my one of my main watercolor sets, but I actually have like two. One bigger one and that one, which is my more mobile um, kind of travel one. Another question over here is how did the watercolor paper handle the washes? Really well, actually. As you can notice, sorry, I keep bringing this back in, but from the back end, there's a little bit of buckling, a little bit of curving, but nothing way too extreme in terms of like crumpling or the fibers didn't really pick up and roll, if anything. I, I used heavy washes for the clouds up here. Uh, this is multiple layers. The, this kind of paper, though, much like hot press, it does desaturate the watercolor. So this is actually much lighter than it was when I applied it. When I applied it, this was actually very dark in value, but I knew it was going to go much lighter. Even saturations get killed a little bit. This is also why people don't like hot press because it kills saturations. Cold press paper, the, the watercolor will sit on top of that a little bit better. So the color and the pigment will really show through. So in this situation, you know, it, it kind of goes the other way, but I actually find that to be very nice in terms of effect. Makes it a bit softer, a little bit more textural, it has more of a parchment kind of old old um, aesthetic to it, I guess, in a way. Um, so I kind of like that look. <clears throat> Hot press paper I don't normally work in, but I like fibrous ragged paper for some reason. Um, Kibda, you're saying you recently purchased a Windsor Newton watercolor set. I would recommend it as a beginner. I think the Windsor Newton set's awesome. I started with those myself. Um, um, so here from Marsh Start is a question. Love your book on the fundamentals, dynamic sketching. Does the order and length of each basic exercise in dynamic Bible matter? So I would say the order does. In terms of length, it should be continuous. So this should be then a rhythm and a discipline of, of a continuous exercise that doesn't really stop, honestly. Um, you should make it a daily effort. So in the book, I cover a lot of grounds of things like line exercises, ellipses and circles, shapes and forms, cross contouring, even hatching and rendering. And those areas I think should be tackled and you can diversify the exercise daily, right? So one day you might wanna do exercise of lines, another day you might wanna do like shapes, another day you might wanna do like hatching. So you can kind of jump around a little bit, but it should be a continuous cycle, day in, day out, every day. Now that's in an ideal situation, right? Uh, I don't expect everyone to be able to do that upkeep wise daily, daily all the time. But it, it would be great if you could, if you were in the mode of training, so let's say you give yourself, hey, for the next eight weeks, 10 weeks, I'm going to go into the mode of training, drawing every day, all that kind of stuff. Then before you actually do your exercise or actual sketch drawing of practice, you should be exercising five minutes daily. So that exercise in the books, lines, circles, shapes, should be five, 10 minutes a day. I'm not saying you have to do them for hours, five to 10 minutes daily reg regimentally. Now, of course, in the very beginning, when you're opening the book up, you're seeing some of the exercises, that should be the priority. So you're spending most of the days of hours, time-wise, drawing-wise, into that specific exercise. So if you're drawing like two hours a day, most of that should be spent on the exercise itself. How long should you do that then? I would say a number of weeks, right? To get them all on paper with, with a set number of pages. Uh, more for the sense of familiarity, not trying to get a perfect exercise or anything like that, but just making sure you really know what it's about. So then from there, I would go into a daily exercise after that. Once you start to go into like drawing of everyday things, right? It could be drawing of animals or vehicles or people or costumes. I don't care. Just make sure, that, make sure that's a daily habit. Should you then keep that up lifelong? Some people might. Do I? Not necessarily. Uh, from my activity of drawing, it's essentially my own warm-up. The sketch I just did earlier today, that's considered like my warm-up, right? So there's still lines, shapes, circles, hatching in that drawing I just did earlier today. So that's pretty much my exercise. Um, form, so a question Clay is asking, what exactly is form? So the difference between the two, real quickly, hold on, I need to grab some, I should have grabbed some scrap paper. I hope the audio, by the way, is much better. Um, here's the scrap. The difference is pretty uh, obvious once you once I explain it. It's just even visual. It's just between these two. That's it. 
So Clay, if you're asking what is form, which one is form? Simple question. I mean, the question is, which one is it, right? If you can't answer it, the answer is the one on the right. It's a form. Why? It's three-dimensional. We have planes, right? Top, front, you know, side. If it was spherical, we have volume. So if you have light coming down, you have things like form shadows, cast shadows, that kind of thing, which gives you a volume of form, three dimensions. The one on the left is a shape. Shape the form. What comes first in terms of breaking things down? Actually, shape. Then we convert them to form for three dimensions. Form is a part of also perspective because we can put it in a space, which is the illusion of depth. That's perspective. Can you drop the name of the book, title, or post a link? Um, yeah, the book that we're talking about is the book that I produced last year, which is the Dynamic Bible. Uh, you're going to find it in um, at the superranius.com. Maybe I can kind of, you know, I'll just write it down here. Look at superrani US dot com for the dynamic bible you'll just find my name that book is readily available now there that sh that this website only ships to the u.s if you go to another store if you're international go to liberdistry.com look up my name and you'll be able to find it if you're international if you're in europe they will ship to you because they're based out in france if you're in asia they will most likely be able to get to you australia possibly south america is a bit difficult right now so this one right here. Let me put this to the side in case I need to uh, get this scrap again. So I'm going to be drawing and talking as we go along. Uh, for people that are in the uh, Instagram section, again, as I said, if you're trying to ask questions or getting interaction, jump over to my Twitch feed as I'm talking to those people right now, and you can ask a question free anytime you want. Um, it should be pretty easy to just jump over. You don't need to download anything from my understanding, but uh, consider it. Otherwise, you can just watch. How's it going, uh, Sumedo? Uh, what is my favorite animal? I don't really have a favorite animal. I find the natural kingdom of animals to be all fascinating. Um, I know that seems like a cop-out to say that, but I do truly find nature overall to be really amazing. Um, if there was one I've studied quite a bit informationally that I know quite a lot of, it actually happens to be the, um, uh, the mantis shrimp, the peacock mantis shrimp, mainly because I've had one. So, you know, they're kind of not necessarily popular, but they're more well-known these days due to things like YouTube and memes and stuff like this because of their extreme nature. Um, but they are very extreme animals. Not the most extreme, but fascinating nonetheless. If you don't know anything about mantis shrimps, or the peacock mantis shrimp specifically, look it up. Beautiful animal. But having owned one, uh, it was really awesome to watch it. Does the book ship to Canada? I believe so, Cross House. In terms of... Super on the U.S., they might, but check it. If I'm wrong, you might have to jump over to uh, Liberty History. I do apologize, but I don't run those sites. You know, they just have my book to distribute and sell, um, so it's up to them. Let's give this guy one of those large, like, massive beaded necklaces. <laughs> kind of like the one that Akuma wears from Street Fighter. This is going to be like some kind of Oni demon. And he's going to be eating his own feast of dinner. I'm going to create this whole scene where he's got like all these ingredients and animals and stuff. He's been chopping up for food and all that kind of stuff. Not necessarily seem just to be gruesome, but I, I, just the idea of preparation is kind of like the idea. Let's give him like more jewelry. I have a lot of like Oni demons and mythological creatures from Asia in my blacksmith book. So I always liked drawing these kinds of uh, creatures. Sorry, I missed a question uh, over from Ven Faith. You're trying to become an artist, but I have never really been a person who drew a lot growing up. I'm trying to find things that are fun for a newbie to draw. Do you have an advice for this problem? It can be unfun to have ambitions to draw grand things and, you know, to be unable to do so. Uh, I mean, from the right off the bat, you know, it's like, I understand the dilemma. I wouldn't really call it an issue or a problem. It's just more of like, you just, you care, you know, you want to start properly. And with the proper step, you feel like you're going to, you know, be able to make the strides and growth in a 
more appropriate way and not really wasting time, I guess. Now, I'm just assuming this. I'm not going to say that's what you're actually thinking, but that's what it can feel like. Is that you just don't want to fail. You don't want to do something that looks bad, right? Because as you also draw, in a lot of ways, you're performing and potentially some people might see it. And it's embarrassing when it's like, oh, I'm, I've done something visually or creatively and you have to like maybe have someone see that. And you don't like the feeling of it being scrutinized or criticized or whatever the case is, right? We all don't like that to some degree. So I can understand why you're concerned about, you know, what you actually sketch or what you actually want to create and making sure that it actually has uh, some, I guess, validation to your skill or I guess even your, your seriousness to the thing. But I don't think you should have to really care about, you know, what it is you start with. I think you should really start with what just interests you. Uh, you could say, but it's too much. I don't know exactly how to draw those things. But if you really liked that subject, if you really enjoyed those visuals, it could be from the animal kingdom, it could be architectural stuff, it could be vehicles or functional things or weapons and people. I mean, there's the world around us, obviously, as the main subject matter. If you're asking about imagination, that's a little bit of a different question. But if we're talking about drawing and sketching something uh, to you know, help our visual sense or to build our skill sets, and also for the fun factor of things, it, it, it's such a subjective question because I don't know what's fun for you, right? So that means I could state anything because for me, any subject matter is equally as fun to draw. Uh, I could say, I love drawing tanks. But you could be like, oh, I don't really like tanks. Well, then I can't help you there, right? Uh, I can show you how to draw a tank. That doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy it though, right? But the only way to find out is to actually discover it yourself. Um, it's something that you have to kind of play with and, and get a sense of like, well, what do you think it is? It's going to keep you enthused. Uh, focused, involved, committed to at least find out how to sketch those things that could eventually become more fun. Just because it's not, just because it's difficult doesn't mean it can't be fun. I mean, of course, I understand there's frustrations, but through those frustrations, you yield better results and you can have enjoyment because you see the return of it. Now, of course, if you're, if you're setting an unexpected, unex I guess, a high bar that can be hard to reach, you got to be realistic of some things. If you're just starting, you can't say that I want to be able to draw what you're doing and what I've been doing has been done for over 20 years. You're trying to compact, you know, your skill set and try to basically compress as much experience as possible within a short amount of time is impossible, even for me. So, um, again, being realistic, but at the same time, not limiting yourself too much, I guess. And, and don't be too harsh either, because at this stage in time, it shouldn't be so much about how well can I draw something? It should be more about I mean, what do I even just find fun in the first place? You know, why am I even doing this? Uh, th there should be nothing in terms of any sort of like hard questions even being asked at the moment. Like what kind of job do I get and how do I make this into a career? N none of those should be even in mind, you know? And I I'm pretty sure they're not. But if they are, you might want to strike them out, you know? Uh, those will come in time and, and they are appropriate questions, but timing is a situation there. Um, I mean, consider it, okay? Okay, let's establish this guy over here. His big back, he's going to have a, a seating position over here. He's going to wear some rags and stuff like that. I'm going to have his arm come up. He's going to wear some stuff around his arm as well too. For anybody who's trying to ask about even tools, don't worry so much, please. Okay, so don't even bother to worry about what kind of pen I'm using. <laughs> Um, if you're drawing with me, draw with whatever you want, okay? If you have a felt tip pen, great. Ballpoint pen, awesome. Pencil, I don't care. It's more about the sense of are you actively being creative? Are you drawing with me? Are you uh, trying to pursue your own routes in that way? And a pen is not going to be the solution. It can make some differences, but it shouldn't be the main focus right now. So don't worry about it. Because even if you knew, it's not going to help you now. That's the thing about that question, right? Like people ask like, hey, what pen are you using? Well, what does it matter right now, right? You can say, well, I can use it tomorrow. Yeah, but tomorrow's tomorrow. Right now, what are you doing? Are you gonna sketch with me? If you're gonna sketch, you don't have this pen. So grab something and draw, please. Let's see, a couple of questions over here. Ooh, a bunch of questions I missed, sorry. 
Uh, what do I like more, modern or sci-fi? I prefer all types of genres because when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter what genre it is, type of stories you want to tell. Because you can put a type of story that's archetypal or familiar or human within any genre and it'll work. So it's less about the specifics of, you know, the setting or the era or the culture or the time or the genre of things, but more the, the story and how we connect to people. Um, and then we can play. We can use all those different areas. Currently for me, though, in terms of a certain genre, uh, it's not necessarily modern or sci-fi. It's actually more historical. I'm super into like the Western stuff at the moment again. <laughs> I jump around a lot, but uh, Native history, Western history, I'm like just stuck on. I'm listening to this podcast called The Legends of the Wild West, listening to all about like, you know, uh, well, it started off me being in Tombstone a couple days ago, but I've always had huge interest in the Wild West. <laughs> in a lot of ways American history too not so much when I was a kid but growing up I just kind of fell in love with it much more um, and of course you know visiting into a, you know, a lot of places of like Utah to Arizona uh, Montana Wyoming you have so much of that American and Western history ar around it I grew up in Oregon as well too uh, so you see a lot of the natives you know uh, tribes and stuff like that um, up there as well so, you know, exposed to it, uh, which just kind of created more of an interest on that side. But um, currently, it's, it's, you know, a lot of those stories. So, you know, listening to right now a lot still more about like Dodge City and the Earps and um, the Masters and Brothers and all that stuff. It's all really amazing storytelling, especially as it was real. Let's see, another couple questions is, for people who are just started learning art, should we start from perspective or is drawing whatever we want more ideal? Both. Right now, maybe you can't afford perspective classes. And if you are, like maybe taking books and stuff like that, it can be hard to interpret. So my suggestion is to just draw, right? But then whatever free lessons or books and things you can find offhand, you know, tutorials online, use them to whatever degree you can of understanding. Uh, but at some point, I think having a more structured and formatted version for something like perspective should be done. Okay. Is animal anatomy important to learning drawing animals? Yes. Simple as that. Uh, let's see. Is form and shape something you improve by simply drawing a ton and improving your artistic eye? I drew a bunch of basic outlines of Kobe Bryant's head today, but none quite look similar. Well, there's a difference between drawing the outline shape of a silhouette of an individual and understanding the structural construction forms of a person's head. Because a person's head anatomy, whether, you know, head study to full body, we got to use systems to help us place in proper proportions, you know, the indication of details, um, all those elements, you know, to make sure accuracy is strongly attained. So drawing an outline of somebody, you're creating a ghost or a shadow of that person and filling in the details afterwards, not really knowing where they go. Then it's kind of like a shoot from the hip. You know, it's like you're not really quite sure if it's going to work or not. And it has a chance of success, but it's not very consistent. That's the key difference about drawing with constructive techniques to drawing by just by sight. Because you can eye something, right? But you're not going to get 100% right all the time, even for me. After 20 plus years of drawing, I'm not going to get every drawing perfect. I can mess up even something I've drawn many times before at some point. I can just misjudge things, proportion, sizing, placement, all that kind of stuff. I can mess up here. But the difference is that if, because I've trained enough in technical methods of constructing things, my eye has been honed more on that side. So even though I don't necessarily apply the construction literally here in the paper, the mental part of it has already been jogged. That's already been kind of like been, um, I guess, applied in this singular situation right here, where I can understand assumption of where things would go better, without having to actually just kind of hope for the best. So the consistency then shows that or proves that you actually have control of something, and that takes then time. 
Again, for people that are jumping into the Instagram, if you have questions over here, I do apologize if I missed a bunch. The feed goes through real quickly. So people are like jumping in and like, you know, there's someone else has joined, the question disappears. So what you're gonna wanna do is actually jump over to my Twitch channel and ask questions there because I can scroll up easier. I can't scroll through the Instagram one. If I think I can, no, I can't. Uh, so I can't even read it. So you might wanna jump over to that side. <clears throat> Question is also, what principles inform your compositions when drawing directly in ink? Well, composition, right? I mean, we gotta describe what that is real briefly, which is the idea of how to actually organize the objects within a frame. The frame could be your piece of paper, a canvas, a photograph, cinematics, whatever the case is. So in your frame, whatever you're trying to tell as a story, you gotta then organize the objects to convey that thing. So whether I draw with ink or pencil or, or I paint it or I digitally draw it, whatever the tool is, first, what is your what, what was the idea? What is the concept? What is the story that I'm trying to invoke here? For me, I like this idea of this very homely, you know, kind of almost um, what was the right word I had earlier? I was I just said it. <clears throat> Not natural. It was it was a si a setting scene, right? Where this demon character is eating and feasting, but I had this imagine this thought of like all the multitude of things he would use to prepare these food, and I always like the busyness of like kitchens and you know cooking and you know, there's something very kind of homely about it. Even though, and that's the funny thing is that we're trying to show a creature that's like you know cutting up a bunch of like animals. I'm gonna draw a dead pig over here and you know all this like cut up meat and vegetables and all that stuff in a big pot, and it's fantasy, right? But I, I, there's that constant idea of this, you know, idea of cooking and preparing and feasting. And I always find that kind of like mood and scene very kind of uh, inviting. <laughs> I don't know why. So. Uh, what amazes you? Drawing process or result of it? If you're asking about more from other people's work, both. Because they're connected in the same, right? Without the process, I mean, you can't necessarily fully appreciate the result. You can always end up seeing a result only, and you can appreciate just the result itself, but you don't have as much connection and also understanding behind it, right? But if you're given that information also, you can imagine how much more you have in terms of being able to, um, I guess, absorb from that information or the experience of actually someone showing you that process. Not everybody does. Because in art books or people who post on social media, they might post up the final drawing in this beautiful render piece, and you can be amazed by that, the quality, the technical skill, and all that kind of stuff. You can assume how that person did it. But imagine when you actually get to see someone posting about that whole process. I mean, there would be so much more appreciation because of it, right? Uh, any advice from an experienced art teacher to a newer art teacher? I mean, that's a loaded question because I could speak about that easily for an hour, cross house. But I'll try to uh, dwindle it down to just a few things. Um, the main one really is this. And it's so cliche when, you, when I kind of say it this way because I'm already kind of imagining how it sounds. And it's, it does sound that way. But I'm not trying to necessarily just say what most people would normally respond to. Um, but it really is about being true to the way you would exp explain things. Right? Your advice on stuff. Your technique, your process, your experience, or whatever your uh, interests and advices are based on where you've taken your life towards. Don't imagine what somebody else would say. Don't imagine what some other art teacher would say. Don't imagine what some previous master or artist that you looked at in terms of, you know, books and uh, tutorials and imagining what they would also respond to. How would you respond to it truthfully, right? That's not very easy to do. Because you then have to really kind of meditate and think about, well, what is it I am trying to explain? You know, what is it I am trying to actually share and show? You know, how would I actually really do this? Are you really only thinking about what some other instructor who's taught you on how to do it would be? And that was one of my main issues when I was, you know, teaching at an earlier age, was I always, always imagine like what my mentor would do. How would he explain this? What would he say in this situation? How would he draw that? And that wasn't true to me. And as well as that may have worked, it wasn't going to, people are going to pick up on that very easily. This idea of a slight imitation to something. But in the beginning, that's all you know. You imitate, you try to transfer, right? Even in drawing, 
you imitate others to capture a certain level of quality, finesse, nuance, to show that your skill level is high. So even in terms of like communication, conversation, explanations and stuff, I think we as people tend to kind of go to either what we have seen or heard or know. So that's pretty common. But I'm just saying that in that, understand these are the, the emotions that you're going through. How do you break it? Not easy. That I don't have an answer to. You just do it. <laughs> a lot of questions today or tonight. Uh, any advice for developing a light touch with using brush pens beyond just repetition muscle memory? I'm heavy handed and usually light lines usually means sacrificing some fluidity. Um, time is of course a common response, right? But it's not going to be the answer that you're looking for nor the, the, uh, the response that you want. You kind of want something a bit more meatier, I guess, right? Um, in terms of that, a whole brush pen, heavy handedness, let's go towards more of the actual hardware. Uh, when you're using brush pens and stuff like that, sometimes usually what, what tends to produce a heavier line and, and a heavier, I guess, heavier hand, for me, from my own observations, tend to be a lot with the grip of things. So people tend to press really hard. So if I go back to my scrap paper, Again, I can have a light touch and produce very thin lines, even lighter if I need to. Okay, then of course, this brush pen has the benefit of being very heavy. I can actually push these really broad strokes. I can also get variation of strokes, right? Thick and thin, the benefit of the brush pen. Uh, but the downside to this advantage for an experienced artist is that it's hard to control this for someone who's just beginning. So how do you then build a sensitivity to your pressure and lightness to things? The first is just to grip. Be careful of gripping too tightly. Now that seems to be pretty obvious for most people. So lightening it is, seems to be the answer, but that's tougher than you think because you're used to gripping it because you're not thinking about it. You're focusing so much on the line, you're not paying attention to what's happening in your hand. Now this takes a lot of them, what you're talking about, repetition of muscle memory, to start to balance all of them together. It's not about just the grip, but it's also then about where you place the grip, right? Where do you place the grip? Now, if you're holding your brush pen very near the front, it's gonna be very difficult, in my opinion, to get very thin lines. I'm actually trying to get as thin of a line as possible right now, at this point. And it's okay, but it doesn't feel as loose to me. So I actually like to hold the brush pen a little bit further back, okay? Uh, I prefer this mainly because I can have a better clearance of view of where I'm going, but I like the, the looseness of my strokes. Notice I don't griply tight it like a fist. I'm, my hands are kind of open right now like this, right? And it's I'm ever so much just cradling it. It's not tight at all. So watch the tightness. If you have a tough time with that, the only way to catch it is to be aware of it. Every 10 minutes or so, watch your hand. Are you white knuckled or are you relaxed? If you're gripping it tightly, after that 10 minutes, take a break. Step away, readjust, regrip the pen, come back into it again. Practice that over and over and over again. From there, uh, sometimes having things of assistance of gripping can be helpful because at a thinner barrel, you might, your hands might be big, you know, bigger than mine. So because you have so much more area of grip, you're probably you know, crushing the thing. So maybe having a little bit more diameter to the pen can be useful. Sometimes, sometimes getting like a gel or like a foam pad that goes around the pen can be helpful. This is a recommendation I give to most of my students in class. So try that if you know if you can use it. Uh, resources on perspective that you would recommend use Marshall Vandruff's lessons. Marshall Vandruff. He's got great you know uh, videos and practices that you can look at on his um, website. He does a lot of lectures and classes you know all around. Obviously, you guys will know a lot of his stuff from Proco. Um, He's got older videos right now. He does do classes at the moment, but um, I don't think he has it up just yet, which will hopefully will go up at some point. There's going to be a bunch of stuff in the stew. Floating. Things like certain vegetables, maybe. Maybe even like large piles of meat. It's not about putting a skull in there, maybe. Maybe human. creature that eats people. 
Now I'm reminded of the scene in Conan. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if anybody here is um, super into that kind of stuff, but one of my favorite movies, Conan. Little design accents for this giant pot made of beaten metal. I want it to be really rough looking, which is why my lines are kind of scratchy at the moment. I don't want it to feel super clean. I actually want to beat this thing up a little bit, adding a lot of texture. A few more questions. <clears throat> Anara, uh, yes, this necklace that you're asking about is the Hei Macau, um, the fish hook from the Maori culture. Got it when I was in New Zealand back in 2010 uh, at a small little peninsula place called Akaroa. This is on the south island of New Zealand near Christchurch, about an hour or two away from Christchurch, I think. I visited New Zealand back in that time. Uh, this is right when, or after the the earthquake had hit in like 2008 and things were all still in shambles it was amazing not amazing but more of a sense of like kind of crazy how much of it was still you know affected uh again i'm kind of scrolling through questions at the moment <clears throat> let me zoom in a little bit closer to the image now you have a concept art question I'm trying to learn uh learn it but i really struggle with iterations like, how do you iterate so many sketches? Well, the first thing is you don't want to emphasize way too much information and detail in those sketches in the first place, right? So an iteration would be a, an example or an idea, an exploration uh, to the concept of what you're trying to create. Let's say it's a character, like a creature like this. An iteration shows us one example of what's possible for that design. So you then do a series of iterations, which could be silhouettes, black and white silhouette, it could be a line drawing, it could be brush strokes, it could be marker to pen, it could be a combination of tools, digital also. So the way you do it is open. It's up to you in terms of how you visualize that information to the audience or to your client. But the iteration has to show enough variation, not really variation, more of possible ideas to give them options as to like, you know, what you can do with it or what they can do with it, right? Because not one idea is going to be the best one. It possibly could be a combination of ideas. So the more iterations you give them, the higher the chance there's going to be a conversation to the next step. So from the iterations, we can go into the variation stage. Let's take those concepts and ideas, piece them together, do another round, right? Um, but that's the idea, of course, as I said earlier, is to keep it simpler. The actual then technique of producing it visually, whether whatever tool you're using, hopefully you are then familiar enough to be able to produce quickly. That could be just technical, but then what about the idea? Well, then this comes in from the amount of experience, right? Research, having a clear intention in understanding what the concept is. If that hasn't been set up pre preemptively, this all comes from mood boards, the research, the conversation with your director, um, the amount of inspiration you can look at, spending hours, days, even in that area first to make sure you have a clear idea of a direction of a road and a path of what your concept is, Coming up with iteration would be really tough. So Inkster has another question here. What advice would you give a person age 28 years old who started drawing after a gap of 15 years after middle school and who loves to draw everything in different mediums and wants to take art as a career? Uh, I don't know. I think you answered your already question right there, right? You love to draw and draw everything. Uh, it doesn't matter how much time is spaced in between you drawing and not drawing, right? The fact of the matter is that you started to begin now. It could be 28. You could have been 20. You could be 48. It, but it doesn't matter when you had started. What was important is that you actually took it up again because you could have also easily not. You could have just continued on at 20 years old doing the things that was expected of you, told for you to do, you know, what you assumed was the best approach either for a career, or for money, or for whatever the means or reason, and that would have been fine. But you didn't. You're back here again. So don't worry about everything that happened in between. What matters is what's happening right now. You've made that choice. Now the big question is, what are you going to do with that choice? 
you know? And I can't tell you what to do. There's no answer for that. It's just me asking you to consider it now. Appreciate all the comments. Thank you guys also for stopping by. Appreciate that. Uh, Jello Spirit is asking, I've been trying to draw landscapes but have a difficult difficulties with the distance between objects and creating an uneven ground plane. Um, yeah, it, it, it can be challenging, but it does have a lot more give compared to, let's say, like cityscapes. Because with cityscapes, your perspective has to be a little bit more structured and uh, a bit more well thought out. Whereas like landscapes that are natural, you have the ability to kind of play with things in terms of elevation or movement of lines and shapes. And you can still give the convincing sense of like, you know, a natural, I guess, world. Um, but, you know, in that situation, still, it's more about the organization of details. So the distance between objects, especially if you have a large landscape into the background of like mountains. In the foreground, you have like a hills and maybe even like a structure or vegetation. You know, you don't want to equalize the amount of information from the front to the back. This is a simple concept of atmospheric perspective, right? So things that are further away because of the gases and the dust and all the stuff in between, you and the object in, in far away distance, there will be less and less detail. Things become more silhouetted. So the closer object of things can have a lot more intensity and density of detail. Things that are far away, you just have a silhouette. I finally caught up to all the questions. Okay, <laughs> cool. We can keep drawing now. I'm gonna have his leg coming out like this direction over here. I'm gonna put a bunch of scars on him and stuff like that too. Um, I'm also gonna put a bunch of um, items. Around. Maybe I have like, first I'm gonna start with like blocks of wood. Maybe he like started a fire or has smoldering fire underneath it to keep it warm. He's resting his leg on it. In my head, I'm kind of visualizing how this scene would feel. I want it to feel very uh, condensed, very busy. I want it to be a lot of stuff around him. This is where it's gonna be a lot of density of darks and details, but on him it's gonna be very clean and simple. So he's gonna be framed by all this chaos of just stuff i'll have like you know just food ingredient kind of laying about and some of the stuff may not be super clear they can be somewhat abstracted mm -hmm. just general shapes that kind of gives you the impression of something and that impression is all i kind of need you don't have to be so specific at things all the time. Because if you are, then it kind of kills the effect. Because, um, again, it's that, even that kind of concept of landscapes, where things that are far away can be more simplified in shapes, things that are closer can be more in detail. In this one, I want him to be simplified. I want everything else to be kind of more craziness of density detail work. But I don't want to be specific about what those things are. I just want to show noise of stuff. Let's put like a tool over here like a knife or something like that. Crude looking kind of knife. Layered with more stuff. He's gonna be sitting on some type of like pad or maybe some kind of fabric. And this will help kind of bind it all together. I don't want things that are kind of sprinkled individually. I want things to be overlapped on top I want stuff underneath that kind of like brings it all in one uniform kind of look. <clears throat> in terms of this live stream, yes, this is the second one for today. Uh, for this particular week going into next week, I plan to do more. Uh, because my classes haven't officially started just yet, which it's 11 o'clock right now. Uh, my class registration opens at midnight. So in about an hour, I'm going to have to go and open all that stuff up. If I'm still in the middle of this, I'll probably just do it live while I'm here, <laughs> opening up the classes and adding seats and positions. 
for anybody who's looking to register. Um, but for the rest of the weeks, I will be open, just working on more gallery pieces. Uh, so I'll have a chance to be able to kind of do more streams. I feel like I need to kind of make up for all the lost streams I haven't done, as promised. So I'm going to try to do at least one every other day, potentially, in the next two weeks or so. Potentially. The only reason why I wouldn't is because either some other plans had come up, um, or I've been playing a lot of games again. <laughs> so I might be play busy playing my PS5. Just more mats and stuff like that. That he's sitting on. <clears throat> uh, what am I playing right now on the PS5? Um, not a lot of PS5 games that are out that I'm playing. I was kind of going back through some old uh, library of PS4 stuff. I know there was a you know recent release with the. Um, Ghost of Tsushima that I might consider playing again because I did love that game a lot. So I thought about maybe getting the director's version, but I'm not in a rush to it. <clears throat> I was playing Mad Max for the PS4 for a bit. I really liked the way that game was set up, but it got a bit repetitive, so I kind of got bored. <laughs> um, some of you may not know, but I'm actually super into sport games, actually. For some of you who may not be interested, really, maybe you're like more into like you know, adventure games, story games like that. But I actually do like sports quite a bit. I've been playing the new NBA games, uh, 2K. More for just the single player. I don't really do a lot of online matches or anything like that. I don't think I'm good enough for that. I'm, I feel too old to play with kids <laughs> online. I do have the uh, Switch, the handheld version. I've heard good reviews of Metroid. I don't know, maybe a possibility. The thing is, when I was younger, I was never a really big Metroid fan uh, in terms of the game. It's because I just didn't play it. I liked the way the, the character Samus looked. I loved the design, but I just never got a chance to really get into it. For some reason, that world of Nintendo, uh, when I was younger, I mean, you know, I played Nintendo when it first came out. I remember I had a friend in my neighborhood when I was growing up in Ohio who had a Nintendo and we all would go to his place and we'd sit there and play Mario. This is like in what, 90 something, um, maybe early 90s, 90, 91, when I first experienced that. My first experience to video games, of course, was the uh, Commodore 64. My uncle had one when I would play Frogger on that. Uh, and that was probably like what, mid to late 80s, something like this. But I only grew up really playing Mario. So I was super into Mario 3, uh, Mario 2, oddly, is not enough too. But that was really the only areas. I think in terms of Nintendo, though, my favorites were Excite Bike, Punch Out, um, Paper Boy, the Mario series. But again, I never really jumped on Zelda, you know, or um, Metroid. But it's because I never got a copy of them, so I didn't really get to play them as much. Of course, the old Ninja Turtles game on Nintendo, that one sucked, but you always went back to it and played it. <clears throat> Question from Vin is, how do you know where the body parts you're trying to draw in a blank canvas without sketching it? For example, mythical creatures where the anatomy is a little bit different from regular humans. For the most part, I usually mess up the proportions and have to start over. Well, it's because it's a creature and it's humanoid, but you can make up the proportions any way you want to. I could have made his foot gigantic. I could have made his head huge. It's a fantasy creature. Who cares, right? Not to say who cares, but it's like more of a sense that you have control of it. But I understand when you're trying to match up to something that is recognizable, let's say like an Oni creature or some kind of like other creature that's mythological, there might be certain parameters you have to kind of fit within. And you're using things like human anatomy, animal anatomy, to say that this is also what I'm trying to look at. But you have to, you have to kind of be careful of being a little bit too exact in those areas, especially for things like fantasy or mythical creatures, because they're not real. And you can do whatever you want with them. And so even this one is, even though it's inspired by like Asian mythological Oni demons and stuff like that, I'm not necessarily following one exactly from any sort of culture from either Japan or something like that. Um, 
You can do whatever you want. Here's Walter saying, wanted to say hello from Australia. Hey there. Currently learning how to draw since being in lockdown. That's great to hear. Use Pinterest to copy what you see. And I noticed my lines have been, or works, line works are getting better. Struggle heaps with faces, hair, hands, and feet. Do you have any tips to get better at them? Or is it more draw, 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 uh, and they will improve over time? I mean, yes, you could just draw, 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 and they could improve over time. But I think if you can find a way to listen to techniques and lesson plans, structured things, even if you took a class, I mean, of course, that would be great, but maybe you can't actually get access to one because you either don't have the financial funds or you're limited in terms of what you have available to you. Uh, but either way, you know, I think having some sort of structured feedback would be excellent. Um, in Australia, it depends on where you're based, but if you're anywhere near Adelaide, I would look into that place because there's a school out there called CDW, Concept Design Workshop, and they're connected to a university out there called Flinders. And I've done a couple of workshops for CDW in, in the past and recently as well, too. I uh, visited Adelaide, what, 2017, um, and I found it to be a very, very great school because I know all the people that work there at the moment, and they're a great place to be connected to. So I would highly recommend it as a place of learning and also just for opportunities of workshops or lesson plans or something like that. They do uh, a lot of online stuff as well. So if you're not anywhere near Adelaide, um, just research it. Uh, Jello Spear is saying, I live in Germany and have been thinking about traveling to America to study illustration and concept art. Do you think it's worth it? Currently, no. Not, not right now. And the reason why not right now is because of the whole situation with the pandemic still and you know quarantine effects and COVID and whatnot. And this is not only just for your health, but this is also because um, you know schools and whatnot are slightly still in shutdown. If you don't plan to go to a college or university, if you plan to go to like these kind of more local schools, they're not fully open just yet. So I would probably wait another, honestly, a year, in my opinion. Now, if you can't wait that long, then I'd probably just turn online first. Go to some online uh, experiences with classes um, just to get that ball rolling. And then once you start to get really prepared, you know, for that information, then you can just kind of travel over here. Would I recommend it, though, if it was all opened up? Sure, absolutely. For one summer to come here. Uh, for like three or four months to train and taking like three or four classes. I've had many students all over the world do this, you know, coming to places like Brainstorm, Concept Design Academy, uh, and whatnot. And I think it can yield very good results because I've seen it. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you come here because, you know, you're trying to find a job here or get, you know, to live here. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. But it's more of the idea of just having the right environment and group of people right and you can potentially find this in europe as well too america is not just the best place you know for this kind of stuff anymore it was in terms of having the educational experience because it just didn't exist out there um but recently you know over the number of years there's been a lot more places and schools and um locations doing a lot more workshops and expos and talks and you know all that kind of stuff and classes as well so research a bit more and, and find out what might be available within your, you know, kind of uh, European neighbors. One I recommended earlier today was the one in Rome, Italy, the uh, Idea Academy. I was supposed to do a workshop there a couple years ago, but then COVID happened. Um, that's the one I would be looking into if you're trying to stay within in the European, you know, kind of countries. It's not too far of a travel for you from Germany. Um, and if it's just for like a, you know, a couple classes and going there for a couple months and coming back. I have heard of Sin Studios Pizza Dog, and um, it's a place that I was exposed to very early on when it started. I met the owner of it and the, and the starter like back in like 2000, and I don't know, like eight, nine, something like that, maybe earlier. And we're, you know, he wanted me to maybe come by and do some workshops and stuff like that. But then, you know, as things happen, you kind of go your own ways and didn't really hear from him again, but I've heard good things about that place. Let's see, let's do uh, another, I wanna put something over here. How about another pot? 
Let's put like waste material in this one. Well, an only demon having waste material makes no sense. Maybe storage. <laughs> storage of other foods. Foods that he's collected out in the forest or he's stolen from people. Or things he's just prepared. Fish. Let's put fish in here. Bunch of fish heads. If I zoom in a little bit, you'll see the space that I have left over. I'm going to fill this entire area up with a bunch of stuff. <laughs> uh, once I lay everything in, uh, then I'll start to go in there and start to hammer out some darks. Uh, Huzal Creative was is saying, I was in Kim Jong-gi's perspective course and was blown away at his drawing endurance, uh, knocking out dozens, uh, like dozen unique figures in 15, 30 minutes. Does everyone at Superoni have that much mental drawing endurance? I don't think so. Uh, I don't know everybody under the Superoni brand. Um, I don't know if I have the same capacity as <laughs> something like someone like Kim Jong-gi. Uh, are there others that have similar skills? Sure, you know, guys like Carl is amazing and Nicholas Namiri as well too. And you know, but they have their set kind of like Rolodex or visual library of things they can pull from. We can easily say that Kim Jong is much grander than ours, but still the majority of us have a set kind of like amount of visual archetypes that we can pull from, right? So in a way we do have that ability to a certain degree, but it does range. But does everyone? No, no, I wouldn't say so. You know, a lot of people under Superani who, who you know, come from different uh, applications of what their industry is, uses all these different techniques. And some of them will go directly to references, images they know or images that they're familiar to. And nothing wrong with that. Do you, is that, a, a, let's say, a, a parameter of being a part of the Superani team? Absolutely not. Do you have an estimation of how long this piece will take? So I've been on this right now. It's been almost an hour. Conversation, of course, extends the time. Uh, if I wasn't talking and I was doing this in one sitting, probably if finish, all up to finish, two hours. Potentially two hours. Mainly because of the level of density of stuff I want to put in there. Let's put another fish over here. Kind of cut up and filleted. And it doesn't make sense to put a fish head over here and he should have just dumped everything in but this is for the visual <laughs> let's put like bones and stuff on this side just a portion of the fish as I said all the stuff in the background will hit a lot of darks so his foot will stand out more let's put more carcass meat on this end over here Now it's just about trying to make up stuff as I go along as to like what I want to put in there. Some things will be more specific, other things will be just kind of more whatever, just general things. Let's put more stuff around like um, tools. Let's put his club over here. These only kind of creatures usually have like big clubs or blades. Maybe it'll be actually leaning over another dead body of an animal. Uh, Free Bellows asking what's playing behind the TV. <laughs> uh, Gundam, the movie. <clears throat> The first one, the very first one. Question, I've had a long-term goal to get into Art Center. Do you know any info, info if they would give full scholarship for international students? I believe they will. Based on your portfolio, you can apply for it. 
uh, I will say that it will most likely be difficult to get. Uh, when I went to Art Center, I applied for a bunch of portfolios, but you know, I never got anything. But um, it's a different time now, you know. So you know, it's not the same as the way it was back then. I'm not saying it was harsher back then. It's just that there's a lot more funding, I think, these days when it comes to scholarships, where we had it very minimally, um, especially in our department. But uh, it doesn't hurt to try. But I believe international students also can get uh, partial scholarships, but also potentially full rides. But those full rides are very limited, from my understanding. It's just like a few hand select people per term, if that. Uh, any more blacksmith books coming out? You know, um, it was both, both the Dynamic Bible 2 and the next blacksmith. I was trying to push a lot as much as I can for this year, but it's going to end up being pushed to next year because I'm having this um, solo gallery show due, which I started from last month. Uh, I was hoping to get some of the books started from last time as well, too. But the Dynamic Bible at the moment is also a little bit not in limbo, but more of a stage of conversation to find out what our next steps are with the Kim Jong-gi group, Superani. So the book itself, yes, I'm creating it, but Superani is publishing it. So they kind of have a say about like timeline, when they want to release, that kind of stuff. So at the moment, it's still kind of like back and forth trying to figure it out. I think the conversation might be the idea that we're trying to release it at a time when other shows might be coming up, things like Comic-Con, you know, in San Diego. We were hoping to do, they were hoping to do New York Comic Con this year, uh, which it did happen. They had a limited kind of opening. I mean, there were still a lot of people there from what I understand, uh, New York Comic Con. But they didn't make it because in Korea, the artists like Kim Jong-gi can't get their vaccinations for COVID. They just don't have them. So they have a shortage of them for some reason. I don't know why, uh, but they're not vaccinated. So, of course, they can't travel anywhere in the U.S. without a vaccination at the moment. Um, so they have to currently wait until that can be potentially remedied. I don't know what exactly the plan is. I don't talk about those details with them all the time. But, you know, the manager updates me here and there. Um, I don't know. We'll see. When the registration of dynamic sketching opens, will it be a new URL or will it be the same URL? Basically, you need to keep refreshing the current URL. No, just open up my, my shop, my Shopify account, and it'll automatically update there. Uh, Critical XA is asking, what type of tattoo styles did I get? If you have any, well, I mean, you're starting to see this one over here. I have a whole chest plate um, that I got back in 2000 and, gosh, when was that? 2010, almost 20 years ago. The one on my arm over here, uh, I got back in like 2000 and I want to say six or seven or something like that. Uh, all the work is Polynesian inspired. Maori tribe specifically. Now, of course, you know, I'm not pulling from any specific family, you know, kind of symbols and stuff like that. These are more just general, you know, Maori shapes. Uh, you know, whether it's like the, the hammerhead shark, the mongo pere, and there's, you know, tea sharks and stuff like that, spiraling and patterns. Um, I visited New Zealand back in 2010 to hang out with a friend who I didn't really know at the time that well. But he reached out to me on Facebook back, uh, back then, and he, he asked me, like, hey, I want to be able to learn to draw with you. You know, like, I want to, to learn from you as a, as a student one day. And I told him, if I'm ever in New Zealand, you know, I'll, I'll definitely assist and help you and teach you certain things. So at that time, in 2010, uh, after my, my mentor passed away, I decided to kind of go on a trip like that. And I knocked on the guy's door, <laughs> okay? So I stayed with him and his family for 10 days uh, at his house out in Christchurch. He's Tongan. Him and his, his, his wife at the time are both Tongan. Um, and he was a, he's a working tattoo artist. And so I reached out saying, hey, I want to come down there. Can I stay with you? He was like, absolutely, come by. So during the daytimes, I would actually explore Christchurch, drive around, rent out a car, drove around different places. And in the evening, I stayed with him and his family. We had dinner, we'd hang out, and I would show him how to sketch. <laughs> uh, and I would show him lessons and plans and show him a few techniques. And we did it for you know 10 days straight and at the end of that trip uh he tattooed my chest so the one sitting it must have been about eight hours it was a night before i had to fly out to la uh and my whole chest was throbbing in the flight <laughs> i had the entire chest plate all the way up here um and it was a story you know that we had built not really a story but more of a understanding of who i was and that kind of stuff and 
you got to know about my career, my my passions, you know, being a teacher, that kind of thing. So the tattoo has a lot of stories on that. So he's the one that designed it. He's the one that created it for me. Um, anyways. Do you recommend sketching first or go straight for pens and markers and such? Do whatever you feel is, is fun for you. Um, if you like sketching underneath using pencil and stuff, go for it. If you're trying to actually train something specific, let's say within a technique like dynamic sketching what I teach, then yeah, I'll have certain limitations. But if you're going on your own, you know, um, just make sure you're just drawing actively. Daily. A few minutes a day, if, if, if anything else, you know. If it's hours a day, great, but you know, whatever the case is. Let's put in a big bore here. It's gonna be under this big club. Free below the gallery that we um presenting this stuff in I haven't fully announced yet so as I'm speaking about it to you guys I haven't actually shared about it so the gallery is actually based in DC Washington DC and it's gonna be at a place called art wino it's a restaurant slash gallery they've hosted Kim Jong-gi years ago and they asked the manager from Superani if they had any other artists that would do a show for them so they tapped me so I'll be doing a solo show for them about 20 to 24 piece collection uh, that's gonna be inspired by a lot of my blacksmith stuff the asian mythology creatures and that kind of thing i'm calling the show the four winds so i'm using the four winds as gods and as you know uh, mythological characters from asian eastern spherical kind of mythology uh, as, a, as a showpiece so um that'll be in mid-november and that's what i'm trying to get done <laughs> So this piece right here will be one of the smaller pieces I'll actually have, as well as a few other select pieces, which I had just gotten started with. Levin's asking, do you have a reference on portfolio that would have a better chance for a full ride? Unfortunately, I don't. And there's no place that you're going to be able to go to to find that kind of reference, unfortunately, Eleven. Um, just due to the fact that it's not online anywhere. I mean, you can, unless you want to ask somebody who had gone to Art Center about their entry portfolio, if you know anybody, that would be the best way to do it. But online, no, you're not gonna find anything. You can get some guidance maybe from the administration and whatnot saying, hey, I need some information about what kind of, you know, things to put in my book. Then they'll give you some of the parameters and whatnot, right? But, um... Sorry, I was just concentrating on this one section for a minute just to like figure out what to do with it. This boar head I was trying to figure out with this awkward angle. Uh, Clay is asking, you hear a lot about drawing cubes, spheres, cylinders. I'm more than willing to, but does it matter how you draw them? Uh, what should I consider when doing that drill? Um, I mean, you're talking about three-dimensional objects, okay? So should I incorporate then things like perspective? If you understand your, your primitives in perspective, then yes. If you don't, then focus on it more of an exercise based on a line, right? Line accuracy. Uh, making sure that the form is relatively accurate. Now, when I say accurate, what am I talking about? Is it, again, the perspective aspect of it? Let's say you don't know perspective at all. Um, here's a, a, a cube, right? This is a shape. Here's a cube. This is a cube using perspective, right? What is perspective? Perspective is the illusion, an optical illusion of space and depth on a two-dimensional plane. That's what perspective is. So I need a horizon line, which establishes vanishing points. That's the use of perspective tool sets to create a form within space. This object over here, I cannot draw this object as an isometric, where all these lines 
are parallel. This is a box that is not in perspective. So what you can practice then is shapes, drawing shapes, literally, then drawing forms, three-dimensional objects without perspective. This is a practice on accuracy of line and parallels, line quality, scale, overlapping, line density practicing, that kind of thing too, right? And repeat that with different forms. Cubes, cylinders, pyramids, cones. Put them together in space as well too, within an isometric view. Uh, what's the fundamentals for landscapes? Um, being able to play with shapes simply. Uh, don't try to over detail. That's one of the big problems of landscape that I've had when I was younger. It just felt overwhelming because it was just so much information. But the idea is really trying to practice on indicative techniques. So trying to show just enough information, right? Through suggestion of detail. But that's easier said than done. <laughs> so uh, taking some formative classes, structural classes can be good in that situation. Um, I'd also say taking maybe some photography lessons could be good. Even doing your own photography in general just to play with it. Kind of honing your eye uh, to look for certain things. This pig is going to be cut in half right here. With the ribs coming out. Intestinal stuff, stomach. Different organs and whatnot. We'll put a leg over here. Let's see, uh, other questions. How many pieces are you working on simultaneously for the show? Right now at the very moment too. This one and a much larger piece right over here. That one's on 18 by 24 paper. It's one of the, the four winds, one of the gods. The four winds consists of the north, south, east, and west, obviously. Uh, there's a certain color that is associated to them and certain animals that are associated to them. So there's gonna be the dragon, uh, the phoenix, the tiger, and the tortoise, north, south, east, and west. Then based on also elements from wood, metal, water, to air. And it's a, um, they're mythical characters and stories that kind of cover a range of Eastern Asian sphere, of cultural sphere. So you'll see it in China, you'll see it in Tibet, Korea, Japan, China, obviously. Uh, Mongolia, all the way down to like Vietnam, to Indonesia, these places. This is where that cultural sphere of Asian hemisphere uh, or Asian location, you'll see a lot of similarities in certain things, culturally. Weird question, do you have an ex approximate idea about the next offering of your courses after this round? Not able to register this time around, but we'll have to take, uh, take them. So, um, well, in terms of an idea, it'll start next year, probably around... I want to say January or February at the latest because this session that's going to start up in November will end probably most likely early January because of the holidays. It'll push some of the meetings out. So we make up for them for the missed holiday meetings. Uh, as we make them up, you know, the, the date as it ends extends a little bit. So um, anyways, next session will most likely be late to January to early February. So it'll be a year, a yearly annual thing in my classes of sessions of four. So in a year, I'll have four sessions total. So right now we're in our fourth session. So through the entire year, I'll offer sessions of classes. Uh, have I ever messed up a drawing so bad that you had to actually give up on the drawing and start over? Yes, absolutely. Recently, in the last 10 years, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, you know, I can't exactly remember exactly which image, but I'm pretty sure there must have been. From when I was younger, I do have distinct memories of not liking pieces and giving up on them. 
I don't, again, I can't necessarily give you exactly what image they were, but I do distinctly remember having those experiences. But in the last 10 years, kind of hard, I, I'm not quite sure. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't think so exactly. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, let's give it. Oh, let's make a another fish, but this time let's make it this fish a little bit more gruesome. Not in terms of the gore aspect of it, but like an animal, a fish that's going to be much more uh, fantastical, mythical, some kind of weird, bony jawed crazy fish. You know what the fish I like was from the early Dragon Ball series that Akira Toriyama would draw. Uh, this is when you know Goku was a kid, and he would hunt fish, and he would do those really crazy large like piranha type ones. I always thought they were funny. He always drew he, he always drew like dinosaurs and prehistoric animals in his world, um, which I really liked. I was a huge fan of the earlier Dragon Ball series when I was again when he was younger. I, I just thought there was so much more playfulness to the work, and obviously it was funnier. Uh, yeah, I like those series early. Uh, is this set of drawings different than the previous ones you had done with the Me Mechanical Gods? Yes, it's different. The Mechanical Gods thing is it's a completely different series. Uh, lucky in terms of the classes for summer, yes, I will offer them. Starting early, no, mid to late January, early February, potentially. Same classes, same offerings, same prices. And it will continue into hopefully the rest of the year. You know, I'm hoping this registration for this fall goes well. Uh, it'll be a sign, I'm hoping, in terms of like the continuation of it. This marks my end of my second year of teaching classes on my own. And the first year went well, last year. I think a lot of it had to do with just honestly quarantine. It really opened up people to take classes and whatnot. Uh, so I think that was one of the factors. So I'm kind of curious how well it'll do this round. I'm hoping it does very well because if it does, it's a sign of sustainability that there's enough people out there that want to take classes. Even as they now get back into their normal day-to-day -day habits of work and that kind of stuff, if it doesn't do well, then I'd be a little bit concerned about its longevity. Um, I might have to end up resorting back to like schools and classes, which I don't want to do. I want to keep teaching my own classes. Um, but nothing lasts forever. And I'm hoping this end of this two year wasn't the uh, run of the mill thing. I want to make sure this is a continuous thing for the, for quite a long while. Um, I've always made sure that the content quality, you know, hits to the equalness of all the other schools out there. Pricing matches to what every other school out there also offers. It's actually cheaper. So based on that and also having a relative strong social media following, I would hope that this would have been a long term thing. So I've, I've, I was actually a little bit concerned for this fall term coming up because, um, I don't know, it's just my brain also telling me that, you know, I think we always try to prepare for the worst, right? So. Hazal Creative is asking, when you decide to draw a new item such as the boar, do you see the item and then draw what you see? Or is it just more like you decide what you want to do and just start figuring it out in the place as they appear? I, it's kind of a mixture of both. I imagine what the boar looks like, not within this pose or angle of the situation, but I just imagine what the boar was. And then I just figure it out as I go. Uh, do sit-in seats still have access to the Discord community? Yes, they do. The Discord community on my Dynamic Sketching class is fully open to the sit-in people. And it's a very active one because the people that have been taken the, or have taken the class in the prior two years are still a part of the Discord. So they continue to share, interact, ask questions, um, post up work, even get feedback. You can request feedback. Now the difference between a sit-in seat to a full seat in my class is that the sit-in seat doesn't get personal feedback from me in the class. So you can show up and watch, listen, do the homework and share, but I don't actually get to talk about it. That's reserved for people that are signing up for the full class, which is also why the sit-in seat is so much cheaper than the full sit-in seat, or the full seat that is. Um, but having feedback is quite helpful, as you can imagine. Uh, do any artists stand out in, to you in regards of their, to the uses of color? Mm, I mean, of course, you know, everybody knows this particular artist, but Mobius 
I actually really love the way he uses color. Very vibrant, not natural or realistic. Very almost um, abstract. I think it's great. Even guys like Sergio Topi, I love the way he uses ink and watercolors. Uh, will, I, will I be in an event somewhere in the far future? Uh, you're currently living in Indonesia and you're studying at an art school uh, for university. I have to get to yeah meet all that kind of stuff at one point. So for me, uh, next year, I'm hoping to be in Paris, probably around the middle of summer for an extended amount of time. I, I'm thinking like four weeks, like a month and a half uh, for workshops, classes, for a school out there based in Paris. The place is called Beaux-Arts. I still have to talk to them. I feel a bit bad because I haven't responded back in a, in a minute. Uh, but that is one of the places. Let's put a giant meat leg over here. Maybe it's like being prepared to be eaten with the classic bone sticking out of it. A little bit cartoony, but I think it's funny. So that's one that's still on the table. Uh, normally, I would annually uh, hit Austria in a place called... Um, oh my gosh. Why am I forgetting the name of it? Hold on, give me a second. All these different names pop up in my in countries I've been to. <laughs> I always mix up the words. Uh, sometimes I think of like a place called Split, which is in Croatia, which I've been to. I, I go to a place called Wutz in, in uh, Poland, which was for a promised land. Um, damn it, the one in Austria. Oh, it'll come to me at some point. But uh, anyways, I haven't been to any in, in Asia, though. I was supposed to be at, at the live event for, or if it was live, the, the um, Manila event in the Philippines. But that went online this year. So now that I've done it, I don't know if I'll be, I don't know if you'll invite me back because they try to rotate artists, you know, annually. So if it goes actually in person next year, I probably won't be there for that one. <clears throat> Will you ever sell a sketching kit for beginners? That's an interesting question. Here's Walsh. I, I actually like the suggestion of it. It sounds interesting. I'd probably like even pass it over to the people at Superani to think what you know, see what they say. Like an actual sketchbook um, that's kind of like a pre-built kit. Sketchbook pens that I would recommend, markers and whatnot as a great starting tool. It's a good recommendation. Um, I don't know if I could just start it on my own because it needs then money to get that going, which I don't have a lot of um, for just that kind of like stuff of starting projects. Unless maybe I did like a Kickstarter. I don't know, maybe. How do you get direction to put your ID on paper, whether you just start directly or making small indications um, to get that flow or direction? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with just from the experience of me drawing, of course, over the many years, just the flow and the movement of stuff, where things connect, where they go. But I think a lot of it is also making sure you kind of understand what you're trying to say through the piece, the communication of it. Again, you're trying to direct the eye in certain ways, right? I mean, I wanted to frame him. And all the stuff around it is going to all meld together as one noisy amount of stuff. But it's not supposed to be about those specific things. It's supposed to be about him cooking. So all the stuff around it would be dark value, heavy detail, framing him. And some of the lines of like stuff will be kind of pointing in that direction, pointing in this direction, right? So focal point. Uh, will I offer sit-in seats of, for courses other than that I'm sketching? I do offer them, which is the extension version of the class and also the design thinking class. So those two classes have sit-in seats. Uh, so weekend classes, I offer one right now, which would be the figure drawing class. It'll be on Saturday mornings, Pacific time. Let's put a bundle of something here. Maybe like sticks. I'm not going to draw every single stick. I'm going to condense it into a shape. So it's easier to read. Maybe I'll have like leaves still and stuff on them to communicate that better. So far I'm enjoying this drawing. Um, it's one of those situations where I think it's important to recognize, you know, drawing can be quite a struggle. There's always a lot of anxiety that goes behind it. And, and you know, you, you can always fight with it, fight with it, but 
for me, this, you know, currently in terms of me drawing, there's much less of that. And for me right now, even this particular piece, I find it just to be fun to draw, you know? And I think I would recommend that's a big kind of goal as to what you all should be looking for, which is when you're just creating, it should be something that isn't going to be taking something from you in terms of energy, in terms of strain or mental, you know, draining of that kind of experience, but it should be adding to you. The enthusiasm, the fun factor, all those elements. I hope that does become something that I think a lot of your focus goes to for all of you guys. Because for me, this drawing right now has been a lot of fun to just draw. It's a bit crazy at the moment. There's a lot of stuff on there. But as I said, I had to lay everything in first. I'm going to hit the shadow shapes and group stuff together in darks and mostly in these areas, keeping him simple. So in my mind, I already know what I want to do with this. Sorry, I must have missed an array from Cynics. So if you guys are still here, we're just sketching and drawing right now. So I do apologize. I'm actually still stuck on the chat way up. Um, I'm reading questions. So people who are just jumping in at the moment, thank you for stopping by. Uh, we're just doing a lot of Q&A, question and answers, sketching and drawing. Um, if anybody has any particular questions, let me know. But I do have classes that are being opened up later tonight in about 20 minutes or so. So in about 20 minutes, I have to kind of step away for just a second. Not step away fully, but just focus on the opening of the classes, uh, which I'll probably still remain live. People are still on Instagram, just a few people, 50 people. But hopefully you guys are enjoying the sketches I'm producing them. Question here is, other than studying and observing, are there any other tips you have with learning structure of what you're drawing? Um, I'm trying to think of a, a question or I guess an answer that wouldn't be so typical because most people probably would say, well, actually, no, those are just the things you would do, right? You look at them, you study them, you draw them, you repeat the drawing as much as possible, learning different techniques from different classes or instructors and trying to find out how to get it on the page effectively or easily, right? That'd be the common answer. But I'm trying to think of something else that could be maybe helpful. Sculpting. Sculpting it. Now, I'm not saying that you should train yourself to be a sculptor. I'm just saying use other mediums to help you visualize. So I'm not a sculptor, but I still like making things in 3D. Not digitally either. I'm talking about like in hand. Now, I'm not even saying you have to kind of build it from scratch with like clay and stuff. You can do kit bashing. I, I love doing kit bashing. I mean, here's one over here. It's kind of broken up right now. I, I dropped it. <laughs> um, this thing used to be a... That was a car. I think it was a Cadillac of some type. Um, and I took a helicopter. It was a Cobra helicopter. And I stripped that of parts. And I put it all together differently. And I made this like floating car thing. This used to have a hood with all these like amazing details underneath here. All my parts are sitting over there. But I dropped it and all like broke apart. But I, I'm going to redo it again. But I love making these kind of like kit bashes of like flying vehicles and whatnot. I painted it, you know, put decals on there and stickers. Um, and it looked really cool when I set it up but I wish it was still kind of in place. But this kind of thing, you know, even though it, it's made from kit parts, it's help, it helps me visualize certain details, certain mechanical parts. I have to think about what these things are. What would they be used for? This frame, this piping, this indication of shapes, what are they? Even though I'm not drawing it, I'm thinking about it as I'm handling it, as I'm looking at it, as I'm turning it, as I'm playing with it. So um, it gives me a lot of visual information or structure that is too. So I'm going to keep moving forward here for questions. I'll see if I catch any here that could be uh, good to reply to. Uh, I'm not trying to skip questions, by the way, but I just have to keep moving forward because I feel like there's a long chat. Um, so question here is, what do you do to control the amount of darks mass in one piece? And where would it be a good place to put them? Just think about the light direction. Is it top down? Is it coming from a certain angle? And from there, you know, what directions are the shadows are going? But don't try to salvage every single bit of detail. Even though I've drawn the, the things in there, one of the problems I had younger is that I wanted to show every single thing. But I'm not afraid to just drop stuff and condense things and lose them a little bit if it helps with the read of the image, right? Uh, do you have an artist or multiple artists that you look up to because your drawings are already extremely good? So I just wonder if you have any 
mentors or anyone you look up to in the art world? Currently, right now, mentors, no. I mean, when I was younger, for sure. You know, multiple mentors. Not, and not every single one of them were art mentors. But are there still people that I look up to? I mean, of course. Absolutely. You know, a lot of the Superani team members are amazing artists who are far better than I am in many ways. Um, you know, but, but we're also just friends. So you know, I look up to them in terms of their level of experience. A lot of them can be a bit older than me. Uh, and so I, I very much am very attentive to their th comments or questions or conversations that we might have when we get together and that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that we actually start critiquing each other's work, but just observing them as people. When you interact with artists, it's not always just trying to understand how they do things artistically or creatively. I want to get to know who they are as a, as a human being. And that in itself can lend a lot of, I guess, um, I guess educational experience in a way, you know, uh, of how to handle yourself in those kind of like situations of growing as an artist or uh, looking for ways of directing where you want to take this stuff for yourself personally, right? Let's do more things over here. Let's put another tool in this side. Let's put a big axe. It's about 11.47. So in about maybe uh, a few minutes here, I'm going to kind of shift my attention over to my Shopify account just so I can update my store. So for those of you that are hanging out, uh, just, you know, chill, hang out for a minute as I handle it and take care of it. I'd like to be able to finish this sketch here, uh, if I can. But we've been on for about an hour and a half. Usually I keep these sessions to a two hour timeline. Um, I've never really gone over that for some reason. I find the two hour mark to be quite good for me. <clears throat> Let's put like a stone base right here. Oh, he's chopping this wood. I'll put like bits and pieces, broken things off to the side. There was a marker, I went past that, but it's okay. I'm not too far off just yet. More stacks of wood. Can't have enough wood. <laughs> and images. It just kind of occupies space and easy to draw. Here's his axe. Uh, how long have I been drawing for? Since the age of five. How long have I been drawing professionally? Since 2005. Uh, so your new year vintage brain welcome is the dynamic sketching your intro course It is a fundamental course and I had people from all walks of life take that uh, who want to learn how to draw Who are professionals that want to continue to really f uh, build their fundamentals? Um, I've had people that were trained in completely different industries and, and wanted to just get back into the creative side of things and um, It does help if you do have some fundamentals in place But it doesn't mean that you can't learn something and pick things up coming in fresh and brand new and because I've been teaching the class long enough, I know how to kind of adapt and negotiate um, the situation and also, uh, you know, kind of making sure the people that understand what I'm talking about and how to try to do it. And also what the focus of the course is about, right? Do I draw 2D game assets on demand? If you're just talking about concept art, if it's freelance work, yeah, I, would, I can be hired for that. And I have been hired for it in recent times as well. Picked up a couple of freelance gigs this year. Not that many. Focus more on my classes this time, but I did do a couple of jobs. I kind of want to create a bigger visual marker here. Um, wait, it's 11.50 right now our time. So I'm going to switch over to the website. Give me one second, you guys. Uh, you can keep hanging out, chat amongst yourselves. You can keep talking to me if you want to. But I do need to go over to my classes and products, and I'm going to update these here real soon. Uh, actually, might as well just do it right now. It's 10 minutes. so And these aren't going to sell out. Um, let me just add my number. Sit in seats will be 20. And 
let me put the chat window off to the side over here so I can read what you guys are saying. <clears throat> How much of your art is independent work versus commissions nowadays? I would say 80, 85% of it is my work, independent stuff. So books that I produce, gallery shows that I have, classes that I teach, maybe the last like 15%, 20%, you know, is like work that I do for someone else. What's the procedure for that in terms of working for concept art pieces? I mean, you get hired on as a contractor, so you get sent an NDA to be explained what the project is. Um, obviously, you know, they would have seen your work to hire you on in the first place. You can also apply for it, and then you can see if, you know, they want to hire you on. For me, you know, most of these people are coming to me asking for, you know, help or whatever the case is. So I don't actively pursue freelance gigs anymore. Uh, I just wait and see if anybody wants help. So that's why I only work on a couple of projects a year. But I'm not, that's not my primary focus. My focus is on classes and teaching and producing my own work. But if I can work on a few freelance jobs a year, I would definitely do so. Is there a friendly competition between super honey artists? So I'm sure there is, but in a very friendly way, for sure. Everyone's super modest. I will say that. Let's do the extension seat. Sit in. No, the card's not open yet. I'm actually updating it right now. Let's do the sit and seat for dynamic sketching. This will also be 20. I have 20 seats available per sit and seat. That's the maximum that I allow. For the full seat classes, it's only 10 people to 15 people at most. Uh, so it's very limited as a full seat position. But that's because I want the experience to be very, very um, more personable, you know. Wait list, I'll just add 10. One hour meeting, I'm gonna add two seats for that one. So I, only, I do one hour meetings a week. So that's people can sign up for a one hour talk to do talk about whatever they want um, it could be you know about their portfolio about their directions if they just need a conversation about their work uh, mentorship I'm only opening opening one seat open just in case somebody wants to talk uh, I haven't interviewed anybody just yet so the mentorship is actually a bit open kind of sketching with the figure this one I had mentioned what 10 people 15 people let's do 15. Actually, let's do 10, 12. 12 people for figure drawing. Mm -hmm. Extension class will be 15. Uh, let me see, I just have to also figure out one thing. Tuesdays, okay. A couple of students that are coming back uh, who had already purchased a seat from the past who couldn't actually act on it, so I have to consider them. Uh, so dynamic sketching, I'm gonna do 14 in this one. And I do also have other students I'm bringing in to give them an opportunity who I met in Kenya, mm -hmm. and they'll be added to the classes. That won't affect the numbers, they'll just be added to it. So Wednesday will also be 15 people. Intro to design thinking will also be 10. So much more limited in design thinking class, 10 people. Because there's so much more involvement of um, design details, so I usually try to limit that. Actually, the figure sketching class, I made 15, so let's add three more. Plus three. Okay, cool. Well, the seats and registration is open right now. For those of you that are planning to join, I welcome you. Uh, thank you for the interest. For anybody who's joining me at the moment in terms of Instagram or Twitch, if you guys 
uh, could do me the great favor of sharing it if you can in any way. I would very much appreciate that by tagging me as well. But you no, know, you don't have to. And I reach out to Arnold, who's the uh, the student from Africa. A little bit later on today. Okay, let's continue on. Let's uh, finish out this sketch. Sorry for the constant buzzing. You're hearing my phone at the moment. Um, let me actually turn that down. Let me see if I can turn it off. There we go. Okay, back into the sketch. Uh, what I wanted to do was place in another large... Let's put in another large animal or beast over here. Um... Maybe some kind of like ox or some kind of crazy bull. Big meat. Just have his tongue sticking out. Saw tons of amazing uh, animals over in Africa when I was there just a couple weeks ago, and and I actually find the Cape buffalo to be just actually really amazing looking animals. They're super scary because they're some of the more aggressive animals out there, as are the uh, hippopotamus. You know the lions are majestic as they kind of always are, um, and, you know but they're so focused on you know their pride and, and hunting for their their next generation and. Of course, they're, they're very dangerous animals as well, too. But man, those herd animals, like the, uh, the buffaloes, they're no joke. Don't want to be out and exposed with some of them around you. What kind of dude was I in high school? A very quiet dude. Super introverted. Sat there and sketched and drew. Not very, um, what's the right word here? Noticeable? Because <laughs> I was super quiet. Nothing wrong with that. It's just what I was naturally, and I still am very much that way. If you're hanging out with me, if you're, you know, sketching somewhere and stuff like that, I wouldn't really be talking that much, unless you ask a question, then maybe I'll say something. But normally I don't really, you know, say a lot of stuff. It's just who I am. I, I don't choose to be that. It's just... The way I kind of, you know, I guess personally I like to kind of engage myself. But um, I'm also very much aware of that. I'm not saying being introverted and quiet is a bad thing, which I mention a lot to my students. But I think it's also the fact that, you know, uh, I, I know how to socialize. I know how to engage because it's also a big part of my job and part of my work. And I also find that to be a lot more fun now because I know how to do those things. Younger, you don't really have a lot of interest. I didn't have a lot of interest in it because at first I didn't really even know what to say i felt like whatever i had to even say didn't even matter you know so um why should i bring up anything that was usually my thought mentality and i'm sure people who are also coming from the same kind of like mentality feel maybe the same way too let your voice not that it doesn't matter it's just that why bother, you know? It, it was just so much more energy to kind of like play it off and small talk sucked and you just kind of wanted to focus on what you wanted to do. That was it. What are your hobbies outside of art? Um, I love model building, as I said earlier. Kit bashing was one of those things, building model kits and Gundam and stuff like that. I have boxes of model kits everywhere. Uh, I love photography, camera stuff. I have all my camera gear right next to me right now. Um, and I just find them to be really, really, the world of photography I find just enjoyable. Really interesting stuff to me. And yeah, archery stuff too. <laughs> I've been recently picking up a lot of archery. Uh, is working as an artist hard for a living? It can be. Absolutely. It can be. Is it hard for me right now? Sure. It is. 
Because there's no guarantee that what I'm trying to pursue is going to work. Even like me right now opening my classes, there's no guarantee that people are going to sign up and take my classes, you know? Um, and I can do all the preparatory stuff if I can. I can be as experienced as possible. But again, there's no guarantee of it. So there is a high, there's a high chance that, you know, my classes will just sit there. And there might be a couple of signups, but, you know, like I said, some years be, some sessions be better than others. I hope it's a good one this year. But um, it can be hard. But, you know, I think it's one of those situations where it, it doesn't get easier. It does get tougher. But because as you mature and you gain more experience, you're able to adapt better. And so you're always able to keep things going and find work. When you're younger, you're limited in terms of how you really engage and adapt your skill set to something because it's so singular. You train yourself to work in this particular field. I want to work in animation. I want to work in concept art. That's all you have in mind. But the world of entertainment art or, or design or artistry is so big, the umbrella of that, right? But you're only seeing just one aspect of it. And the more you do this kind of stuff, you start to... Im you start to be able to see how and what you do has so much more, uh, I don't want to say benefit or usefulness to things, but you start to see other strengths and areas that you have that is better fit within a certain direction. But the only way to find that is to then really open yourself up to opportunities, experience. Opportunities are always going to be there to some degree. It's just that you don't necessarily always see them. Nor you want to, nor do you want to act on them because you feel like it's not what you want to do, so you let it kind of pass you by when it could have been actually a very good thing for you. So I think when you're younger, people you know kind of wonder it's like you know should I just hold out and and you know eventually wait for the job that I'm really looking for or should I just take any job as possible? I mean I wouldn't recommend just take any job. Uh, I would say it's it's important that you're getting paid for it. That's really the critical thing, right? Being a paid professional is really the most important aspect um, but in terms of what the actual job entails I think you should be a bit more open you know to try things you can say that I didn't really want to do such and such I wanted to be a character designer in animation but I got a bunch of like gigs for advertising work take it you know because it could be a good step for you uh, that could eventually lead into something else uh, for me when I was younger when I left the art center I wanted to work in animation also I had great contacts over at Pixar. I knew all the people. My mentor Norm had all the contacts also. My portfolio was built for that. And when I graduated in 2004, I applied for Pixar. Or at least tried to get interviews and talks with the art director and stuff like that. And you know what happened? Nothing. Okay? No talk, no interview. They didn't even consider me. My work wasn't strong enough. It's like, well, shoot. I kept applying for other jobs here in L.A., uh, and I eventually got hit up by a company in, in Burbank called Technicolor for video games. My intention wasn't necessarily for be video games in the beginning, but, you know, I enjoyed games. It's like, okay, I guess I can take this job. I need it. I need to start working. So I took it on. Um, and it led to a lot of great stuff. Lucky Bamboo is asking, what do you recommend as a, for aspiring artists that are balancing work on top of you know, art classes. You know, it, I know it's not easy. Um, I can talk about this again for like a goddamn hour, but I don't want to do that. Uh, just simply set your priorities. At the moment, your priority might be your work because you got to live. And the art stuff might come into the side because you're trying to get into that world. Eventually, you will need to jump into that pool of wanting to be a professional artist by going to classes, schools, full time. You'll have to at some point. Uh, anybody I know who's migrated from one discipline or career into the art world eventually had to fully jump in and start training seriously. You can just test the waters and like, you know, I'm working full time or I have a part time job. I can take one class a session. Great. But it's going to take you double the triple the amount of time to get to a point of competitiveness in your work. And by then, again, you may not have a direction. You might be going in circles. So I wouldn't. Not to say I wouldn't recommend that. It could be a good place to kind of begin. But at some point, you will need to fully commit. This idea of commitment is a huge conversation I had with my classes this last session. Uh, I, I found it to be a very important topic for me. It's because of... Um, again, I don't want to go too deep right now. <laughs> but, but it's that sense of like, 
you know, why are you here trying to do what you're doing to be an artist, right? And you can say, well, I love drawing. It's like, okay, great, but I love drawing, okay? And I'm not saying that what you're experiencing and that you think saying that you love drawing is, is me discounting that or, or saying it's less than. Absolutely not. But it's more of a question that I present. Are you as committed to drawing or in love with it as I am, right? Because I have given my entire life to it my deathbed will be of drawing and sketching. That's how infatuated, obsessed I am of drawing. I can't stop thinking about it. I want to draw all the time. I'm not saying that you have to be at that level to be successful. I'm saying regardless of career success, I'm talking about personal endeavor, personal passion. And those things can yield the byproducts of monetary gains or career gains or whatever the gains you want. But that can't be the priority. The priority has to be about your commitment to this thing. And me, as I'm invested, you have to imagine that there are people out there that are doubly or triply more so, that are 10 times better than I am. So if I'm in a pool with these people and you're trying to commit into this world, at some point you will be jumping into my pool. You are now going to be competing against someone like me. All right? And are you as committed as me, knowing that the fact that there are other people out there that are even greater, right? Now, that's not to scare you. It's actually supposed to make you excited because you can see then where things can go. I'm not trying to be as good as the other super runny people. I think I can be better. It may not happen, right? For sure, it may not happen. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. And if it doesn't, I don't sit there regretting, being like, oh, why couldn't I be as good as these people? That doesn't matter. It's more of a sense of the pursuit. So how much commitment will you have into this to get to that side right anyways it's a much longer conversation I could be having but I don't want to go much further into it uh, so I'm going to kind of skip through down into some of the chat over here oh, sorry I must have I missed a couple of questions ask again if I didn't reply to it Uh, can I give you tips on drawing muscles? Well, observe actual anatomy, right? Sounds simple enough, you know, uh, looking at anatomical studies of books and stuff like that. But that's where it kind of literally begins. Uh, I'm not talking about like looking at photographs of actual people because, you know, you don't know how to draw those people yet. But looking at more medical stuff like diagrams and orthographics, the turnarounds of different parts of the body, the, the you know, the anterior to the posterior sections of things and you know from bigger sections of big muscles to then the smaller stuff later on but taking classes again is a big part of like on the anatomy stuff that really helps you incorporate or at least be able to process the amount of information that's there for that does it mean you have to learn every single muscle not necessarily uh, i would say for myself just knowing the major muscle groups is all you really need that's all i know i don't know every single muscle in the human body <laughs> i don't know every single bone in the body I just know enough to be able to do what I do. And that's enough. Let's draw some large pumpkins. Let's do like squash and fruits and pumpkins and stuff out here. Big ones. Vegetables and whatnot. Norm used to draw this these pumpkins for class. It's still so memorable to me in terms of how he drew them. It's kind of similar to what he did, what I just did here. I heard hard work enthusiasm for what you do goes a long way. Absolutely. Uh, when was the last time uh, you've been bored of drawing? <laughs> oh God, I don't think I can remember. I don't think I've ever had a time where I've been bored of drawing, ever. In my 35 years of drawing, okay? Again, I'm 40 years old right now. I've been drawing since the age of five. I can't, Im I can't even remember or even imagine a moment in time in my 35 years of actually drawing, from a kid to right now, where I felt like drawing was boring. Never. Honestly. Truly. I know it doesn't sound 
fathomable or, or realistic kind of sounds like, oh, you're just saying that to make it sound like you're, you know, whatever the case is. But I, I'm being as, I mean, there's nothing else I can say. It's just truth, really. I can't think of a moment where I felt like, man, I can't do this right now. This is just not working. I'm really bored of it. It's like, this is not fun anymore, that kind of thing. Somebody asked a question like what, you know, versus a kid from now, what, you know, what did I draw or what did I like to draw? That's the thing, like the stuff that I drew as a kid, I still draw right now. You know, like the characters and dinosaurs and animals and creatures and stuff I make up and worlds. These are the things I drew as a kid. It's not any different than what I'm drawing right now. Is that there's more technical skill, you know, but it hasn't changed in terms of how I imagine it or I play with it. It's still me coming up with worlds. It's like having a toy, you know, a dinosaur toy and imagining a world that was, you know, that, that is a part of that actual subject, that thing that I have in my hand. And when I was playing with, you know, my friends as a kid, and this is back when I was like 10 years old, whatever the case is, you know, I used to have a lot of toys I would have, right? You know, Marvel toys or uh, dinosaur toys. I'm talking about like kids toys, you know? But it wasn't just a visual thing. I mean, I could actually imagine this entire world around it. And I would actually sit there with my friends and we like make up stories and we'd have like wars and battles and stuff like that. You know, the whole typical thing that kids would do. But it hasn't changed in any way since then to now. Mojo, appreciate that. Thanks for uh, signing in. Hopefully you'll have a fun time in the class. Let me refresh to see what's going on so far. Um, <clears throat> the dynamic sketching classes are filling up, sit and seat wise. Full seats for dynamic sketching. About five seats have been sold. It's a good amount. Yeah, a couple class seats here and there are getting sold. The figure drawing class is filling up. So this is just in one night. Uh, usually in the next week or two, we'll start, things will start to kind of fill up more. Um, Sunday night is also a bit of an awkward time to have registration. Normally I would do it Friday night, but Sunday is when I chose to do so. Hopefully things will work out just fine. Cool. Uh, what traits impress you most in a student? The, the enthusiasm, you know? The enthusiasm creates a good personality because they want to learn. They're not going to fight you in terms of like going against like what you're trying to say or do or they're trying to create excuses. Uh, the excitement generates the interest and the drive of wanting to do so. Whether they do it well or not is not the point. It's the fact that they have this internal, you know, just excitement of wanting to just pursue it. And that's also very intoxicating to the other people because it creates a very... I guess um, a, a nice drive for the others to pursue things as well too. Have I created any graphic novels? Yes, The Blacksmith. I think that's actually pretty close to how much I want right now. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, I thought about adding a few more pieces on this side, but I kinda don't wanna do more over there. Um, you know, actually what I might do is just place in like plants as if you know the landscape is kinda pulling through a little bit here. And this won't make it as busy, but at least there's some sort of visual information there. Have I tried Rebel or Rebel? I'm assuming Rebel. Uh, I have not. I'm not sure what that is. Question from Twitch. If you can explain it to me, uh, I'll try to le learn more about it. But I do not know what that is. Okay, let's start to kind of hammer in some dark areas. I'm going to start around the character, kind of start in these darker regions and sections here. When I say group my darks, it's about going in there with the heavier side with the pen, with a bit more pressure, and kind of in between some spaces, dark crevices, areas where the least light will kind of show through. Uh, I'm going to start to kind of hit these darker groupings with contrast. So I lined everything first, 
in terms of the objects and subjects of things that they're around them. And now I start to kind of push in heavier values. And some of the stuff of detail will start to get clumped together. And as they do so, uh, you might lose some of those details. But right now, I'm not trying to show those specific things uh, within this uh, in the illustration, especially in these areas. Um, I want to make sure that the darks of all this stuff frames the silhouette of him in the pot. Now, I didn't want the pot on fire. I kind of wanted it to be almost like on stones that were kind of heated or something like that. I thought about maybe like creating smoke, but effect work, I didn't want to put in this because it would just create an extra layer of complexity that I don't need right now. Um, So we start to push in on here. All these individual darks. Let's zoom in a little bit more onto the video. So you get a bit closer look as to what I'm doing. And a lot of the stuff that's like, you know, abstracted or, you know, unsure about what, what they are, you just basically just drop them in the shadow. These are going to be like stones and heated rocks and stuff like that, or leftover vegetables and food pieces. Here's his foot. The fish behind him, I want to be darkened so that the foot will be silhouetted. I'm thinking of just a general top-down light. Sorry, the stream is a little bit chugging a little bit. Sorry, the stream was chugging slightly. <clears throat> Hopefully it'll catch up in just a moment. Instagram seemed to be stable, but it was mostly Twitch that kind of chugged a little bit right there. Apologies. Hopefully it's catching up for some of you guys. What I was just mentioning right now was that um, these intricate small details, like I said, I want to kind of push down. You know, here's where the foot was with the fish. And I'm trying to like really get that darkened up into the background. Of course, sometimes one of the, one of the difficult things about this is that you lose your place. You know, you kind of forget what you were looking at and what you were doing. And all of a sudden you put down a mark or a shape or a detail that you didn't really want and then it feels like you messed up. So stuff like that, usually with practice, you're able to adapt because that thing can happen to anybody still. <clears throat> Even for me. So as I make those certain mistakes, I don't necessarily freak out. I say, actually, I can use that. You know, I know how to use it for uh, an accent or a certain detail, or I can hide it within shadow shapes like this. And it's no longer a problem. Here's the underside of another fish body. The darkened scales. Stuff below it, there'll be like cast shadows or, you know, just stuff piles upon piles of things. Or like blood. <laughs> Maybe like puddles of blood and stuff from the leg over here. So you can start to see again how I'm starting to frame his silhouette. Let's pull back now a little bit. Uh, Barb is saying, it's a painting program focused towards emulating real mediums behavior. Uh, Rebel. No, I never heard of that. I'll have to look into it, though. Uh, thanks for suggesting it. I'm always interested in, you know, kind of seeing new software programs for painting and drawing, uh, especially if they kind of replicate, well, all digital mediums are trying to replicate something traditional, especially in terms of creative parts of things. Um, you know, whether it's like clay or painting of brush strokes and lead and pencil or inks. That's what it's really trying to do digital-wise, right? Is replicate the, the uh, traditional mediums. So if there's a program that's really trying to do that more accurately, 
Sounds cool. There was one I used to play with. I don't remember the name, but it, it, it was for a watercolor, a watercolor digital program. And what was really amazing about it is that you could do these awesome like ink, ink washes kind of stuff. And digitally, you can actually move the canvas. And as you move the canvas, it would actually have the flow or saturation of inks move in that direction based on gravity. It was pretty complex. It would crash all the time, but it was really cool. <clears throat> now, welcome, James. Glad you were able to catch it. We're going to be going for maybe another half an hour, I'd say, as I kind of block a lot of this stuff in. The base drawing has already been kind of complete, uh, but now it's just about making sure I can kind of fill these darks and start to really frame the figure with the contrast and the shadow shapes. And it's gonna get it's gonna start to get late here, so I don't want to go too much longer. Uh, tomorrow will be the continuation of uh, my gallery pieces, so my hours usually are at the moment still kind of like late night. I normally go to bed around like two, two a.m. Get up probably around like ten. Relax a little bit, have lunch, you know, probably around like noon, uh, and then I'll start to get you know into work late afternoons usually. But I'm such an evening person. I didn't really start a lot of my work until like, what, 9 p.m., 10 p.m. today. So um, I just seem to my, you know, find myself a lot better when I'm starting evening-wise. It's just the way I'm programmed, I guess. Uh, do I still have any interest in animation? Like doing animation, 2D animation? No. no. I've taken an animation, uh, an animation class when I was much younger, uh, 2D animation, hand drawing it, and it was a very nice experience. It was cool to make my own little animations. Um, and it's all very kind of fundamental based. You know, the walk cycles of animals and people, you know, the whole uh, push and pull, um, you know, bouncing ball kind of stuff. And it was all drawn on paper with pencil and everything. And we'd have, this is back in my, my old school after high school, I took a class on that. And we would actually, you know, capture all the frames and put them in a program to edit the entire thing. And we'd actually even show the videos at the end of it, you know, all of our animations and stuff. It was fun, but I I realized very early on that I had no interest in doing that. I do fast, find it fascinating. I think it's a really amazing trade and skill uh, to be able to actually capture lifelike motion and movement through, you know, that kind of process of drawing. But yeah, I think that was a bit, a bit too much for me. Okay. Things are starting to fill in. Let me zoom out just a little bit more. You're definitely more productive in the morning, as Clay is saying. Yeah, I'm not. I can get up, you know, when I need to. I don't prefer to. <laughs> but in terms of working, no, I've never been a morning working person. Like every, when I was actually working in studios, like game studios and stuff like that, you know, of course we get up in the morning and come into the office and whatnot. And this would be around, you know, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. we get there. So I'm waking up at like 8. Um... And when I get into the office, I don't just start working right away. I would need at least an hour to kind of like wake up and settle in, have my cup of coffee, you know, surf the web a little bit, chat with people online, uh, go through emails, the work emails, all that kind of stuff, go through meetings. And then I will start working probably around like after lunch. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure anybody who is also working in the studios and offices are pretty, they understand that. Um, I think the amount of actual hours I think most common people were in the industry of work, you know, out of a, what, eight, nine hour day is maybe like four or five, if that. Now, of course, there are, I'm sure there are a select few that will 
work the entirety of that time. I certainly was not one of them. But I was still productive, and I still got my I still got my stuff done. I'm not saying you were being lazy and not getting your deadlines done. But there was you know a whole ritual in terms of like getting yourself prepared through the day and actually doing some of the work and whatnot. Anyways. Uh, do, you decide, do you decide the scene, uh, your drawing, or you just go for it? No, I had the idea. I knew the concept or the idea of what I wanted to go for. Do I have the visual? No, but I had an idea. At this hour, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are more international coming in. Uh, probably a lot of the East Coast people are falling asleep. So we're based like in New York or East Coast near the U.S. It's going to be late, like what, 3 in the morning. Uh, for people on the West Coast, you know, it's, started, it's about 12.30 right now. There'll probably be a few people here and there. Most likely a lot of them are going to go to bed soon as well too. So at this point, at this hour, most likely it'll be international people in Europe, which would be about what, 9.30 right now a.m. for you guys? Close to 10. Unless you're working full-time jobs, uh, if you're a student, hopefully, you know, maybe then those people will be joining us. It could also be then in Asia, which is going to be a little bit later than that. I'm not trying to rush through this at all, so I'm trying to take my time, indicate the way things I want to. Uh, because this piece is going to be used for an actual show. You know, I don't want to necessarily just get it done for the live stream. I really want to make sure that you know it's thought out, it's controlled. East Coast is still alive. Yeah, vampires, you guys. Finishing some character concepts, awesome. It's 10.30 in the Middle East, great. You know, I've wondered, um, like in the Middle East, how much movement of interest there are from younger people wanting to do things like this. I think it's growing. Um, I've noticed a series of artists coming from Tehran, you know, Iran. Uh, and there's been one guy I've been following on Instagram. God, I have to remember his name. It starts with an F. But he's uh, Persian, Iranian, and uh, he runs a school out there, from what I can, I can, as much as I can tell. And the guy can draw so well. Uh, he's amazing in what he can do. In Dubai, I figured there would be some growth as well, too. Uh, but there seems to be a movement in the Middle East, which is great. I love seeing growth and interest and also opportunity um, and you know I, I'm glad to see that kind of stuff because for me I love traveling you know in any place that has interest in these fields gives me the opportunity to visit these kind of places you know to be able to visit like Iran one day would be amazing to be able to visit Dubai or wherever especially with the intent and purpose to you know interact and meet people and to teach and to share. I and mean, why not? In Jordan, that's awesome. I think we still have some people on Instagram that are watching. If you guys are watching right now, a lot of the questions and answers are coming from my Twitch feed. So if you go to Twitch and under Peter Han style, you can watch from there and ask questions free. Uh, I will interact with a lot more people on that side. Uh, my, my phone is set up in a way where I can't really read the questions at the moment. So if you want to ask questions, please jump on that platform. Or you can just watch and listen. Dubai is a, basically a real life sci-fi concept art city. Yeah, it looks like it, huh? It looks amazing. 
But I hear it's not very, like, um, I, I mean, again, I'm just assuming, not as active with people in the city. I hear it's kind of empty in some places, but I could be wrong. Because it's, it's just, there's so much, you know, in terms of structure and infrastructure, but there's just not enough, I guess, people. <laughs> I don't know. But it looks amazing, you know. Uh, places like that in Asia would be like Singapore I'd like to be able to see. Um, I haven't really been to Asia a lot. You know, I went to Korea when I was just a kid, and I barely remember it. And this is also in the 80s, so it's a completely different world as it, as it is now, right? Today, you know, Korea is so modernized, and especially in Seoul. But I don't really know much else about it because I haven't been back since the 80s. <laughs> there's a reason to go back. You know, I still have people I can visit, and, you know, there's a Super Rani crew that I can go by and see, and... You know, just for the, the roots of it. and I'm not that close to my Korean roots. and I can speak the language a little bit. and I can generally understand it. Um, but growing up in the West, in, in America, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of this kind of like apprehension because you're not really quite sure if people are going to be welcoming <laughs> and that kind of stuff because you've forgotten the language and because you're not so as connected to, you know, the origins of that land. Or the culture that is. It's awesome to hear some of you guys coming from all these different countries, from Romania, from Iran. <clears throat> Are you still painting oils? I am. Do you plan to work on anything after those two wildlife pieces? I will be. I just bought a canvas yesterday, a large 18 by 24. And I will do another wildlife piece because that's why I went to Africa to gather more references. And I wanted to paint more animals. Uh, so I plan to do so hopefully soon in this coming month or so. Once I finish up all the registration of classes and things begin to fill up, hopefully. And if everything goes well, um, then I'll be more comfortable to be able to just go you know, into my other practices. But until then, I'm going to focus heavily on promoting the class and trying to get it filled up. I actually just varnished the um, bison painting that I did um, a couple months ago. I was going to take it with me to Africa to give it as a gift, but unfortunately it wasn't fully dried. I was using a certain medium, and it just took forever to dry the surface of it. So I didn't want to take a wet oil painting with me on the plane. This is going to be like all organs and guts and stuff like that, so it's going to be all darkened up. Let's push the darks down. Let's have the uh, ribs come up a little bit in terms of visual. Notice I haven't really changed pens. I've been using this one pen throughout the entire thing. It's a felt tip brush pen. Uh, it's given me a relative good fine point. It's got a bit of texture to it. Now that we've drawn with it, in the beginning I asked you guys not to worry about it, but now that we've drawn with it, uh, this is a Kuretake brush pen. Kuretake. I don't know if you guys can see it, but uh, the actual pen itself is, I have no idea because it's all in Japanese. <laughs> um, yeah, I couldn't even tell you if I, if you asked. Where did I get it? It was given to me by a friend. I should check out Sohil Danish. He's an Iranian production designer, costume designer, and illustrator. I will definitely try and check it out. Sohil Danish. It's a cool name. The reason why I would like to be able to actually visit places like the Middle East and Iran is because I have a lot of very close um, people who I consider family who are Iranian, uh, the Persian. So my mentor, Norm, uh, he married into a Persian family. His wife was Persian. So after he passed, I became very close with his you know, 
uh, kids, his immediate family, then his wife's family. And I got to know, you know, them very, very well. Uh, so yeah, always eating with them Persian food and stuff like that and <laughs> that kind of stuff. So it was um, always very nice to experience stuff like that. Couple of the comments and questions here. You want to visit Seoul one day, partially because there's a tattoo artist base there you'd like to be able to commission from. That's awesome. And one of the hardest things to grasp is composition. Any tips on that? Well, again, taking a lot of classes based on composition can be helpful. If you're, if you're gonna maybe train a little bit on composition, I'd actually watch a lot of film and also any sort of um, talks or videos that present composition in a cinematic way. So go on YouTube, look up composition on cinematics, how movie making is done, how framing is done in film, because it's such a useful aspect of going into like illustration, but also the kind of entertainment design work that we do. Uh, so learning basic compositional skills from photography, like cinematography, is a good place to begin. Uh, what's your thoughts on about digital and does it much much more easier to find a job over a traditional? Well, if you're working in games and entertainment arts, digital is a pretty standardized tool set. So yes, you will need to be very proficient and comfortable working digitally, but it all starts from traditional. So what I said earlier in this live stream was to balance both digital and traditional, same time because you're gonna use both. One, to build skill set, mileage, and also um, the sensitivity that comes from traditional means. But digital because you wanna become more familiar to those tool sets. So you might as well get started now. How can we study efficiently? That's a good question. Tough question. How to study efficiently. Uh, I mean, I have no direct answer for that um, because each class or approach and method of learning can be slightly different as you go if it was my class specifically like dynamic sketching it's all about understanding your goals and scheduling really well okay goals and scheduling is a big part of it for, for what I would say but I mean it, it applies in general as well too uh, in terms of being able to study effectively because with a good goal and schedule you're able to balance then, you know, your multiple potential classes, your life and also work you got to do, um, making sure a deadline is done. But on top of that, to set those goals in timely manner, it's also being very familiar of how long certain things take you to do. For instance, if you if I asked you to sketch for me a certain thing, it could be a fish, an animal, one sketch, a study based on how I show you how to do certain things. How long do you think it would take you? Now you have no idea, you, you can't answer that question. But based on after taking the course, or while you're taking the course, you might be able to assume that through then the experience of doing it bit by bit. The more familiar you become with the amount of time things take you, you're gonna start to schedule your th stuff a lot better. If I ask you right now to schedule your, your week from the activity of drawing the figure, you know, and say so you're gonna be doing 30 figure drawings by the end of next week. You don't know how to really schedule that because you might not know how long it takes for you to do one figure. But if you knew that number, you can really start to organize your thoughts on how you partition that time, day to day, into the end of the week for the deadline for the following. So I think that's a huge aspect that I think needs to be gained through experience and combination, awareness, um, and trial and error. Mahar, uh, you just enrolled in Dynamic Sketching. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. One of the late East Coast people. Uh, you have worked through the Draw Box curriculum. Yeah, that's great. Which is, uh, you hear is based on my approach, but not totally the same. Well, the guy who made that how Draw Box it was my student. So he, re not requested, he asked permission to start Draw Box uh, from me, which I gave approval to. Uh, not to say that, you know, he has, I'm 
kind of gatekeeping this thing. I mean, if he did it anyways, he would have just done it, you know, and I couldn't say anything else. Uh, all the only thing I mentioned was that I just wanted to make sure that he paid homage to where it came from. Not me, but people before me, guys like Norm. You know, my mentor Norm was the one that created the the title of Dynamic Sketching. He didn't invent it, this specific technique, but he brought it together in a package in a way that you understood what it was about, right? Uh, and he left off after going through lessons drawing insects and some animals. Do you think I could start in the extension class or is it non-negotiable? No, I mean, if you have some exposure to that and, and you feel relatively confident understanding what the whole class is about, you can start with the extension class, I would say. But I mean, you know, you being here now to ask that question, I'm giving you that approval, you know. Uh, if you weren't here, then I would say, you know, most likely you would have assumed that you need to take the base version. But I'm going to say that based on what I'm hearing from what you're telling me, I think you'd be okay taking the extension version. Uh, would I recommend the dynamic sketching class for someone who is a beginner? I mean, if you can afford the, the interest and also the, the finances to take some early perspective classes, I would recommend it. But um, you can still learn a lot from dynamic sketching, even just as a beginner. Because eventually you're going to take perspective anyways. So if you take a class like Dynamic Sketching, you start to realize how perspective will fit and why it's so important. In Dynamic Sketching, you can draw a lot of things even without perspective. I will show you that. I can show you how to draw vehicles without perspective. Um, but once you start to understand the benefit of applying that perspective to get much more dynamic angles, much more interesting you know, turns of form, uh, then it becomes critical to really learn that stuff. But as you're trying to just build the mileage and the mental mindset of how to draw, Dynamic sketching can be a good way to start too. Because I talk a lot about um, the balance in life, the mindset of things, the physicality of drawing, and the mentality of drawing. Not just as a technique. Uh, question here is, I don't have access to drawing schools where I live, so I've been learning online. But most of the time I find myself lost without knowing how to continue practicing. Yeah, so going on, you know, uh, online classes are cr crucial. If you're actually taking actual classes, you'd be good, but it sounds like maybe you're doing like online tutorials and videos, which is not going to give you a lot of feedback. You need more people around you, I would say. So look for more opportunities of actually engaging with individuals and people. If you can afford it. And it's a better route financially than, you know, going to like a whole university, right? If you think, I can't afford it now, well, hopefully you can save after a year, you know, maybe you can do that. Yeah, we all, we talked about that pen thing earlier. <laughs> the question is like, what pen am I using? Uh, this is a Kodotaki brush pen, felt tip brush pen, but I don't know the name of it. It's all in Japanese and I don't read Japanese. All right, things are filling in nicely here. I might go back and start to fill some more areas in together instead of making a lot of noise and just kind of like compressing, compressing even further. Uh, this is a good first pass so far. I'm feeling still confident and satisfied with the piece up to this point. I like the busyness of what I wanted to go for. I like there are a lot of things that are still kind of coming through as an indication, not as a fully realized thing. One of my thoughts on web comics, I think they're great. It's an awesome opportunity for young people to kind of get something online and share their stories. Uh, comics is something that anybody can do. Anybody. Now, there's levels of difference in, or quality difference of experience, of course, in terms of what you can draw and how you can draw things. But everybody has something to share, the story eventually. Especially as you live through things and you know you have things of experience that you go through. It's a great way to connect individuals, storytelling. And not everybody's built for that, you know. Storytelling is hard. Um, I am not a writer, you know. So, but I attempted it for my comic, and it was rough. But it's still, I think, something that all artists should experience at least once. Trying to produce something of an actual storyline, short story, full story, big project, small project, whatever. But try it.
I don't know how many people are on Twitch at the moment. I don't have an actual number. Uh, let me see. 165. That's not too bad. I was just wondering because based on if it was a very low number, I would consider maybe um, ending this very shortly. We've been on for about two and a half hours right now. It's a bit longer than what I would normally go through. I still wanted to kind of finish this as much as I could online. Um, here live, that is. Which I'm getting closer and closer. I still have this area and region to get through over here as well, too. And then, of course, a lot more fine-tuning in between some areas, uh, which I will continue to do so. I mean, this won't be fully finished tonight. I just wanted to make sure a lot of it was, uh, a good portion of it was complete in terms of direction, visual information stuff, um, the grouping of shadow shapes, whatnot. Uh, struggle with drawing with the human figure and I don't know how to practice drawing it. Would you recommend learning to draw each body part alone than the entire figure or just do more drawings of the entire figure alone? So again, it's a combination of all those things. It's not just one or the other. Don't make it so black and white. Uh, learn multiple techniques from different artists from books, you know, whether it's the Richmond technique, the Riley technique, you know, Loomis or, uh, and again, some people are going to like these artists and some of them are not based on if you're a very traditionalist or if you're someone who's looking for diversity of things. Um, but the idea is to expose yourself as much information as possible. And there are many resources online and books and stuff like that you can look at. But in terms of my recommendation, if you started with my figure drawing class, I would actually start with the torso first, the main torso. Now you can go with the whole eight head count system, but I would actually start with something you can actually build from, a core, so the torso. From there, I go to the limbs and to the head. So then I focus on the individual parts and I bring them together and try to fine tune and balance, hone in on the proportion through the constant repetition. Uh, when did I realize you can draw without guidelines? Uh, there was no realization. There was an activity of doing something. And then you look back on it like, oh, actually, this is, you know, easier to do or it's more comfortable. But it, it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a gradual shift of uh, an awareness or I guess a confidence. It's a confidence boosting aspect of it because it, it's not just a skill you kind of pick up on a, as an on and off switch. Um, but it's the familiarity of subjects. It's the method of understanding how to visualize. Uh, all the techniques that I've learned from schools or classes or teachers is an aspect of it. Um, then, like I said, the personal confidence boosting of growth of just, you know, the mileage. And all that grouped and collected together uh, comes to a point where you don't even think of that question. There's never a moment of thinking of, oh, I feel so much you know, more confident now. It's not that way at all. You just do it. You just feel it. Appreciate you guys all asking questions. Yeah, we'll be ending here real soon. There's a lot of good questions today. This was a good stream. Uh, earlier today's stream was pretty good too, but uh, again, it was kind of earlier in the day, so it was a li little bit less people. But right now, there was a lot of good activity. And of course, for the registration of the class, thank you guys again for support of any type. For those of you that joined in and registered, and I'm looking forward to seeing our start, I'll be sending out a welcome email probably at some point this week. because uh, I have to wait till a lot more people sign in. Uh, that way I can send out a uh, welcoming email about details of certain things, but expect that to come within the week or so. Um, material lists will start to go out for that as well too, with that email. But if you wanna start right away, uh, all you're gonna really need for people that are taking dynamic sketching are things like the sketchbooks, the sketch sketchbook that I would recommend. Um, I thought I had it on me here, where did it go? Here, this one. Sketchbook I would recommend for the dynamic sketching class is this Strathmore paper, tone tan, or the gray or the white. Doesn't matter what color it is. Uh, this sketchbook is more readily available. It's a good paper to draw on. It's a good size as well too. This is the one I would go for here. Um, I've been drawing in this one already for the you know the Africa trip. You know the animals in here were live. Uh, this is being on location, sketching the animals in Africa, live drawings, live drawings. And it handles ink really well, handles marker pretty good too. It does bleed through to the other side, so you'll want to draw on one side only. I will buy a pack, a collection of felt tip pens. I might get one marker, and that's all you're really going to need right now. Because the following week after that, you can purchase more things. Uh, but for that first week, all you want is just the basic sketchbook and a couple of pens, please. For the figure drawing class, I welcome both digital and traditional at the same time. Uh, the mediums in, in the drawing for a figure drawing class is more open. 
So it's not just pens. You can use things like pencils and ballpoint pens and felt tip pens and combination together. So there's less restriction in terms of tool set in the figure drawing version of the class. Uh, form language class is mostly digital. You can still use traditional mediums, and I welcome them, but tradition or digital helps speed and efficiency on that side. Can an online course help you more than a real art school? You quit school to pursue freelance, but I feel I'm lacking still with fundamentals. So I don't know what to choose between online courses or going to art school. Both can be great. Both have up and downs. I think right now it's more based on your opportunities, what's local to you, your financial situation. If you have the finance to apply for a full-time school, go for it. I think that could be great. But if you don't, then going to these online classes can be really good too. And there's so many options. The hard part is trying to choose which one to go to. Conversation, asking questions to people that are also around, maybe even here, could have been a part of that. So you should ask, like, hey, wh what classes do you guys take also? Maybe somebody could respond. Um, but I think there's there's no way to tell me that one is better than the other one because there's no real answer to that. It's an experience. And the only way to find out what works for you is to go try them, essentially. But that's if you have the financial means and it's not going to be too much of a risk for you on that side. I mean, everything's a risk to a certain point, and you have to invest, right? Even the money side of things. So try it and find out. I'm going to finish up this horn right here. I'm going to do a couple of small little touches around this part again. Uh, I still have more to dabble on on this side with the bore. So there's a little bit more work to be done on this piece. But... It is pretty much on its way. I mean, there's no more thinking now to do in terms of this particular illustration as to like what I need to capture. Everything is pretty much set. I just have to like do the actual work now. Sit down, you know, fill in the darks, get in the shadow shapes, hatch away, uh, kind of fine tune, balance it. But this one's pretty much check mark. The real work was the beginning, right? The thinking of it, the idea, how to start, what's in the image all those things and while I was talking with you guys I think we solved a, not really solved but more like got all the visuals that I wanted onto the page for those of you on Instagram um, thank you for joining in appreciate that this will most likely be shared again on my feed so you can watch it later on the quality of course will not be the same compared to like watching on my twitch channel uh, this particular video will be shared on my YouTube probably in about a week or so, maybe a little bit less than that. It'll be more available immediately for people that are subscribed. Um, if you want to watch it again, go through some of the questions, hear some of the replies. It can be good as a background thing, you know, as you're kind of producing work or drawing and sketching to kind of listen to. Um, so it's going to always be there if you want to listen to it. Then, of course, the archives of all my previous live sessions are relatively there. Most of them, not all of them. Uh, when do we know that you're going to do an art class? Like, take some students for you to teach right now, third PHP. So registration was happening an hour ago. So classes are available right now. Go to Shopify, look up my handle, Peter Han Style, or just on Google, Peter Han Style Shopify store, and you'll find classes that are open to registration for dynamic sketching, for figure drawing, to classes of design, um, available right now. It'll probably take about a week for it to fill up to a good degree. So you are not you don't need to, be, need to be in a rush at the moment because there's gonna be so, a lot of seats left over, so. Uh, what skill as an artist took you the longest to develop? Mm, color and composition because I'm not good at color very much still yet. Uh, it, it's, an hard, it's a hard concept for me to fully integrate because it's such a different way, you know, the way I see the world. I see everything based on shape and line, and color is all about light. So if you're a painter, you know, you're, you're analyzing light and how it works and, you know, the world around it, but I don't see the world that way a lot of times. So I find it very difficult to interpret color. I'm more comfortable now, but even then, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm as proficient. Of course, I'm not as proficient as many painters of friends that I have. But that was my focus. My focus was on drawing, line and shape, communication.
Do I have an art account on Instagram? Yes, just go to Peter Han Style. You'll find more information there. And again, thank you guys for responding and, and commenting a couple things. For those of you that really hang out long enough, and I hope you enjoyed the overall stream. As I said, I'm going to be wrapping up here in, in about five minutes or so. It's about 2.40 in terms of our time sense, so about two, and, two hours and 45 minutes is a pretty good amount of time. So I'll be closing down this pretty soon here. If anybody has any last comments, questions, uh, you're more than welcome to ask before we end our session here. I'll be back again most likely on maybe even tomorrow, honestly. Um, depends on where I'm at, but most might be tomorrow as well, too. I might actually jump on for about, an, I don't know, an hour or two, uh, one session. Tuesday, I have a class meeting for CGMA mentorship, which I won't be available for a live stream. But then the day after that, Wednesday, I might be back on again. So... Uh, for the next two weeks, I'll be a lot more active on my live streams. So follow me on Instagram. You'll see my stories when I post when I'll be going up. Usually like 10 minutes prior. I announce it so that way you can kind of jump on and get ready to you know listen in or ask questions or draw with me. Uh, for those of you that are working on, on um, Inktober stuff, it's a good chance to be able to hang out and draw and chat. Um, sometimes you kind of need a nice little environment with people there around you digitally too, you know, to be able to converse and talk and connect. So that could be a good place to kind of get to. I might, I've had a lot of requests for my own personal Discord. I have a Discord for my classes, but I don't have my own Discord that I run with people that are on there. I just, I haven't th started because it seems like it's going to be a lot of channels to work through. I have so many Discord channels I'm, I'm part of. So I'm a little bit hesitant, but at the same time, it could be good because especially it's a great way to announce live streams. Uh, I might potentially do that. It's a possibility. Anyways, it's been fun. Um, I haven't done this probably in about a good couple months because I've been so active on traveling and working and trying to get classes done and ready, but I'm glad we were able to do uh, two sessions today. <clears throat> Question here of um, uh, Ink and Kayan is, would you rather be remembered as a great teacher or a great artist? Why not both? You know, <laughs> you know, there's always this uh, stigma where the instructor or the teacher was never really someone who pursued or never got to a level in their career that was remembered. And so all they resorted to was teaching, right? There's always that stigma, I guess. Um, I certainly hope I don't come from that route <laughs> because I've worked in the industry long enough and uh, I'm not turning to university and schools you know I'm, I'm running my own thing now um it's a way for me to actually in a lot of ways stay valid because as i'm teaching i'm still actively working i'm still producing i'm still you know generating content um it's not necessarily a former dream or pursuit it was something i've already done and so the teaching was something that as an after effect of being able to share those experiences, right? <clears throat> but anyways, I, I think both can be reached, in my opinion. Not to say that that's my priority, you know, and, and uh, would it be great to be recognized as one of the uh, greats, quote-unquote? Sure, but if it doesn't, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> uh well, that's cool. In, the, in terms of Discord, you know, being able to share um, the automatic announcements, I have to look into that. I don't know how to run them all perfectly just yet, so I have to do a bit more research. You were thinking about starting up a, a YouTube channel, Yellow Spirit, um, but I don't know if I'm ready yet. Any advice? Yeah, start. Start now. Because as you start now, you'll learn and you'll get better. Do you think you'll ever have a moment where you feel like, hey, I think I'm good enough now and I'll start my YouTube channel? Of course not. You'll always have those moments of like, man, I can be better at this. I can be better at that. And you'll always hesitate. Forget the hesitation. Just start. That's one of the things in my own personal life I've tried to kick is this form of hesitation. You know, there was an opportunity. I didn't act on it. I could have talked to that person. I didn't act on it. Why? Because I felt like I wasn't good enough or what I was going to say wasn't important. Right? You, you kill your own opportunities 
You shut your own doors and no one does it against you or for you. You do it to yourself. So try to find a way to act, right? I'm not saying be hasty and be non-conscious, but in good opportunities, take them. But also in, in opportunities that don't yield any sort of risk. What could go wrong or what could harm you by starting up a YouTube channel? Nothing. If it gets good and it grows big, great. If nothing happens, then nothing happens. And hopefully you'll be on top of it to try to actually yield some sort of result. But it's free and there's no risk to you, so why not? You find uh, that even in myself, I ask this or that question. Perhaps it's because there's this idea we can only be good at one thing. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I respect your outlook to it. And if it you know helps you and gets you to a certain point, that's fine. But I, I personally don't think it's about getting good at one thing. You know, it's, it's about the pursuit, the curiosity to live and try things. Whether you'd be good at, good at it or not, you get to try and say something about it. You get to have an opinion about it because you've experienced it. And even if you're not the best, you're never going to be because there's always going to be someone better. There's always someone better. But that's a good thing because that gives you then an outlook about how it can be done and how someone can take it to a certain direction. It inspires you to say, wow, that's a great thing also what they're doing. I want to try that. But then you don't present it by saying, well, I'll never be as good as them. Who cares? How good can you take it? then there's no regret. All right. Again, I'm going to keep hammering away at the rest of this stuff. But for now, it's about 12.47 our time. Well, we got a pretty good amount of stuff in here. Uh, I still need to kind of plug away in a couple of things and kind of fine tune some essential areas. Um, and we'll get there. And once I get this done, I'll share. I'm not going to actually watercolor this one. I'm going to leave it black and white. But I'll share it on my Instagram probably tomorrow afternoon or so. Once I get the uh, rest of it done. But tomorrow if I do start up another Instagram, or not Instagram, sorry, a live stream, most likely it'll be in the late afternoons or evenings is most likely when it will happen. So follow me on social media of, of Instagram. I'll start to post on a story as to when that will happen. Um, there's nothing stopping me tomorrow, you know, in terms of doing a live stream. So more than likely here on Twitch, I'll do so. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the overall experience of drawing with me, conversing with me, being curious and asking questions, which are all welcome and great. Um, enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and I hope you see you guys next time. And if it's tomorrow, great. If not, maybe the next couple uh, days. Um, real quickly, there's another last couple questions, which is uh, the Chinese zodiac sign. I'm a rooster, actually. I was born in 81. Uh, what's the key to your texturing stroke lines without them looking random or out of place? Um, focusing on shadow shapes, really. It's not even a lot of texture. It's shadow groupings, right? Value. So focus on that more. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate that. I will see you all next time. Good luck with whatever else you're working on today and tomorrow, and I'll continue on then.